Hey everybody, what's up? It's Chase. Welcome to another episode of the show. Today is a very exciting episode of the Chase Drivers Live Show here on Creative Live because it's episode 300. That's right, 300 shows. And so before we get into, uh, I think, the meat of the show, it brings me great pleasure to reminisce just a little bit. I made a few notes here uh, about something that I think is um, important for you all, the listeners, to know. Um, my goal is to deliver an abundance of value in every single show, but my hope is that if you know a little bit of the history, if you're new here, uh, then welcome. Maybe this will be interesting. And if you've been listening, as many of you have for more than 11 years, uh, then this will maybe take you down memory memory lane. Um, I know it, it struck a chord with me as I was making some notes for this episode, Um but I think if you look back, you get to see a little bit of history, a little connection, and that also informs where we are going. So um, I want to go back to the very, very beginning, why I started this thing in the first place. And my belief at the time, go back to uh, photography, I think it was around 2009 when we started the show. And first of all, there was very, very, the concept of a podcast um, was extremely rare. Um, I was one of the few podcasts that I knew out there in the world. And the idea of a photographer talking about photography back in those days on such a show, such a podcast was even more rare. So there were some news podcasts that were being, that were very experimental at the time. Apple was early on in developing the platform. But most of me, most of my ambition had nothing to do with technology or building an audience or connecting um, with people through their headphones uh, on a run or sitting in traffic or uh, it, it was very much about my own curiosity and creating community. And it's hopefully not a surprise uh, because those things have been uh, core to my my personal values for some time, but the technology was just emerging to be able to do this, to be able to record an audio and a video file um, way, way back in the day. And I was looking around the photography industry and recognized that as I looked at my own career, that the best stuff in my career, the things that, that, that helped me break through, that um, inspired me, um, were things that were beyond the photography industry. They were beyond even what we thought then of as um, as like independent creators, or there weren't really these monikers that we have now. I just recognized that I was drawing inspiration from authors and musicians and comedians and athletes and every corner of my day-to-day -day life, of my ambition, of my friend circle, what drove me to read books and to, um, to pursue uh, knowledge. Most of that came from beyond the photography industry. And I was baking all those things into my work as a photographer, a director, and an entrepreneur. And I was like, well, I'm doing this work to source all these, you know, bits of inspiration and meet cool, creative people. Uh, so why wouldn't I just you know, share that because that's so much of my, my early relationship to these social channels was about revealing what I called at the time, the black box of photography. I know it's hard to imagine this, but there were no, it was before YouTube was invented. There were no, uh, there were no videos. The concept of a behind the scenes didn't exist in 2004, five, six, when we started sharing them, we were sharing them on different platforms. YouTube then came about this understanding of you know, fusing what interests me beyond photography. And maybe instead of me just doing that research and meeting those people and sharing those ideas with a small circle of friends, what if I did it in real time? And, you know, it, it, it went from uh, recognizing that there was a emerging platform called Ustream that allowed anyone to go live on the internet. This was a beta piece of software that had been developed to connect military families to uh, those serving overseas. We adapted that technology and started sharing live feeds from our studio. This was the very beginning of the show Chase Jarvis Live, which again has had sort of a handful of different um, iterations. 
But it takes me back to the very, very first one. We put a notice out that, hey, we were going to use this technology. It was an experiment, did not know if it would work, but we were going to point a camera in our studio and do a podcast, a show, a live show, video and audio around me taking photos for a record cover for a punk band. And it was called Brent Omaker and the Rodeo. And if anyone in the world wanted to come watch, ask questions and have this podcast, this show be interactive, then come check out the Chase Jarvis live show. Um, I was shocked that after we turned the cameras on and, you know, had sent the message out a few days before that uh, at, at one point during the photo shoot, I was recognizing that there were 25,000 people watching from all over the world and they were watching me interact with the models and the talent and the art directors and the you know moving lights and equipment around so it was again it was a, a, a photo shoot but it was also with musicians and we were collaboratively creating their album cover and that first experience of course i recognized that there was something very real here and that we wanted to um to capture this and I had already experimented prior to that with releasing both video and audio only excerpts on the podcast platforms that had preceded that in the 2006, seven, eight world. And this just seemed like this really cool collision. I was again, making the audio and the video files, uh, putting them out there and you used to have to pay for downloads. So if you had a really popular podcast, I remember this one time I, I um, had a popular video that we put out on a thing called Viddler. It wasn't YouTube. And it was about um, how to build, put a, a, a laptop in a to-go case so you could do digital photography anywhere. This was in 2005, I think. It was so popular discussing that and making the videos, showing the videos around that, that it cost me, I think, $11,500 for that one episode, that was the bill I got from the hosting company. And so anyway, pack all that stuff up together. And this idea that I could broadcast live uh, photo shoots, live events, if you will, whether those are a conversation, a photo shoot, a musical guest that I would host in my studio, it, it became something that was much larger than a podcast. It had a footprint that transcended photography. It transcended what was previously thought to be podcasts. Um, it was integrating video and, you know, the YouTube culture that was rapidly emerging. And it became uh, ultimately, what I believe, is a, a juggernaut, a seed for so many other things in my life and in the lives of others, many of the guests and co-creators, collaborators, musicians, um, and and others and so the takeaway from my sort of ranting about the early days of the show is this was a stepping stone for me and i believe that all of the things that you are doing now the experiments that you're doing for your portfolio or making music on the side or the path that you see for yourself at your workplace all these things are stepping stones to our next thing as this has been for me. And we thought, you know what, since we're doing this for you out there in the world, um, what if we had an in-studio audience? So we started inviting people to attend in the sh in our studio, just come hang out. We put some chairs up there and said, all right, good. We're going to put this out on the internet and see who comes to, uh, who wants to come, come watch it. You know, we figured it would be local. Lo and behold, people were traveling from all over the world to sit in our in-studio audiences to hear conversations and musical performances and photo shoots such that we had to cap it at about 100 people and they were literally selling out people flying from europe from uh, uh we had new zealand and australia we had shanghai it was just crazy to have so it's just this you know go back to my opening sentiment here around creativity community around experimentation um, and doing this in real time on a live platform. Um, there was also a bunch of questions we got from the very, very first episode. The show had been in black and white. And again, nothing else on the internet was 
in black and white at the time. In fact, we took a lot of criticism, like, why are you doing this in black and white? What, you know, it's, you think you're so artsy fartsy or something. And to be clear, what we, the ambition behind it was multifold, but first and foremost was how can we simplify all of the stuff? Because it was in a live working creative studio. How can we simplify the distractions, the people walking in the background, and simplify to the most basic things that we could? And that was great audio and to simplify the visuals. So black and white was a decision that was a part of that sort of mentality. And it turns out it also helped because we had a naturalized studio and we were using some tungsten lights and we were able to, to use this mixed lighting, what would otherwise create some weird color palettes and hues and whatnot on that color camera, we were able to simplify that as well. So uh, definitely the earliest and first black and white show on the internet. Um, and what we saw in doing this thing that was completely experimental, having other photographers show up again, musicians, artists, athletes, entrepreneurs, people who had inspired me, and I would literally just send them a mail and say, you know, I'm doing this thing. Um, and by the way, like sometimes, you know, 50,000 people will come watch live uh, and we, can, we have absolute control. There's no television studios. There's no sponsors to answer to. Um, I would love to host you as a guest, for example. And the most insane people were saying yes to this because it was so early in its um, incarnation. And that's that was the start of the show and since then obviously it's evolved uh now we do video we do podcasts or audio we syndicate uh in a bunch of different places we've had guests and performances but you can see if you're new to the show here you can see all of the stuff embedded in there which makes me so happy and and excited to again hear in this 300th episode um knowing that community was a huge part of my ambition around this uh, I think it's it's fun to look back and share some of the conversations that I've had. And I don't know if this is fair for me to sort of name some names, but these are all people that I'm close friends with, so I, I believe they wouldn't mind. But these are people that have either told me straight to my face or often on their podcasts when I'm a guest there that the show directly inspired them to either start their show or was inspirational and motivational and helped them uh, get started. And those are, again, dear friends, uh, like Rich Roll, for example, um, you can hear our conversation about this exact topic on his show. If you go listen to my episode on his show, um, Tim Ferriss, uh, was an early guest on, on the show and he, you know, we had an insane engagement and he was like, wow, this, this podcast thing is really interesting. And then, uh, a couple of years later, I ended up being, I think I was his second guest ever on the Tim Ferriss show, um, as he was experimenting with the platform, um, Gosh, again, early musical acts, the Lumineers launched their album uh, on, they did performed live on the show when they launched their album that ended up going multi-platinum. Uh, the same is true for Macklemore. Uh, he launched the heist on our show, uh, did a five or six song set. Um, again, these are, these were just small bands, Augustine's. Uh, we broadcast the Capitol Hill Block Party, Sir Mix-a-Lot, Fantagram, Father John Misty, all these musical guests that are now headlining festivals all over the world um, come perform music at our little studio. So um, also other folks I mentioned, Rich Roll, Tom Bilyeu, Nick Knight in the show studio. Uh, this show was the first interview that Ryan Holiday ever gave uh, when he wrote his very first book called Trust Me, I'm Lying. Uh, it's just I'm, I'm feeling, I'm waxing nostalgic here. So I recognize that, that this is going a little long, but I, and I don't want to take credit for any of this. To me, this is about um, acknowledging that it was the beginning of an important and developmental stage in my career, in the arc of sharing media, um, in matter hour having conversation. I had Gary V when, on the show and he was still a wine guy because he, was, he had caught my attention. He's like, so tell me more about this show. And, you know, when I told him that, oh, we just had, you know, 63,000 listeners while you were, you know, here on the show, I, I remember, you know, he had his wine library TV, but I just watched the wheels turn. And um, if you've been around for a long time, I want you to know that you have been a part of history, a part of establishing the show as 
um, the juggernaut and that it is the uh, mainstay. Uh, it's been so fun to cross paths with so many incredible, incredible people, the guests that all you have to do is scroll our guest list and it, it you, you get a sense of it. Um, also, it has given me a lot of conviction in the power of community. It inspired me to impart uh, write the book Creative Calling. Um, it made me want to have the opinions and voices and guests that were underrepresented uh, be on the show and uh, give a voice to creators who maybe wouldn't be able to be on any other show. We've had some guests from people who are just new and emerging creators. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you so much again here for episode 300. Um, and in turn, it makes me want to uh, share with you one of the early episodes where you get to see this amalgam, this mashing up of, of culture. I think this, I chose this one as a one to share with you. This is, I think, one of my early, maybe five or number five or 10 or something like that, uh, the live shows. And it's, um, I think, again, it has to do with music, with culture, with creativity. It was filmed in black and white. Uh, featuring two amazing friends, uh, both located here in Seattle. One is Ryan Abeo. He, uh, at the time, was a hip-hop artist here, well-known in Seattle um, for Common Market, which was a, uh, his, him and a cat named Sobzi uh, were playing music under that moniker, and they had just launched a new act called Victor Shade, which was a, a moniker that Ryan used for himself. And it's, so it's myself and Ryan in conversation with a man named Charles Mudide, who is uh, an amazing writer who writes um, for the weekly uh, culture paper here in Seattle called The Stranger. He's also done several films as a director, a writer, and a director. And he's largely a cultural critic who's been at the, uh, certainly uh, uh, seminal in the world of hip hop and writing about hip hop since the way, way back. Uh, and so... My hope in sharing this was you get to see both the production and a very, very early uh, mixing of all of these favorite things. Inspiration. I was inspired by hip hop. I was inspired by Charles and Ryan. We talk, you know, there are um, all kinds of different uh, attributes to the show. We talk about, you know, the role that race plays in hip hop. The, you know, is this, um, you know, the role that, that music has on us, the role that you know, we have as creators to create the future that we want to see in the world. Um, I'll, I'm going to stop talking about all of the things that have happened, but just know how nostalgic recording the intro to the show is for me, how inspired I am by you, the community who show up over and over for the hundreds of episodes that we've put out over the past uh, decade and more. It just means the world to me um, and we are never going to stop. And if you want to know where we're going, again, it's take some notes from the past. Think about how I could mix and remix these things uh, and turn a new chapter uh, here in the show as, you know, over the course of the next year, you're going to see some evolution, bringing back some things that have been and that are always been, I think, a big part of the show to make something new and even more special. So thank you for participating. Again, this conversation is yours truly, Ryan Abeo recording artist, Charles Medede, writer, director, cultural critic, talking about hip hop, the currency around it, racial tension, collaboration, but mostly how art creates culture and how culture creates art. I think it's an, an amazing launch pad for the next 300 shows that we'll do. So I will wrap this up and let the rest of this uh, program speak for itself. <laughs> Hello, Internet. I'm not quite sure which camera to be talking at right now because you guys don't have your tally lights on, but uh, I'm Chase Jarvis, and I'm grateful for you guys coming here and paying attention to what's going on at Chase Jarvis Live. Um, for those of you who are new to Chase Jarvis Live, I'm a photographer and a filmmaker, and um, I have been trying to bring things that are behind the scenes in photography and video to the Internet in this kind of live setting whether it's a photo shoot, uh, behind the scenes filming, um, or most recently, and what this is a good example of, is that I'm trying to share with the world the things 
and the people that have inspired me along the way and people that I think uh, you guys would be interested in connecting with. Uh, we've got a lot of new viewers today from, from perhaps the hip hop community um, and Seattle in general and, and much, much larger than Seattle uh, are paying attention to what it is that we're doing. And I have two guests that I'd like to introduce. Um, one, kind of the subject of today's conversation, a good friend of mine, an amazing, amazing MC, um, Ross Sion uh, of Common Market and his new, his new project, which is what we're really here to talk about today, called Victor Shade. And, uh, and then, boy, what do you say about this guy over here? Uh, Charles Mudede, he's a writer, filmmaker, and a cultural critic. And we thought we'd have kind of a roundtable discussion that uh, is talking in and about music generally, hip hop culture, and hip hop music specifically, and, uh, and how this relates to what it is that you're doing with your new project. Um, without further ado, gentlemen, welcome. Thank, thank you, you so much. Yeah, thanks for having thank you. us. Um, can you start off, or can we start off by you telling the world, but actually tell, tell us here at the table, mm -hmm. specifically what, what's the, the genesis behind Victor Shade? Um, I don't have a prepared answer for you, so I'll, ahead, I'll, I'll do my best to wing it. Sure. Uh, the, the project, the Victor Shade project, was, was born out of two things. One is a relationship that I have with MTK, mm -hmm. uh, produced out of Everett. Uh, this guy's been working hard for several years, uh, and over the course of the two and a half, three years that I've known him, uh, I've collected more than a hundred beats of his uh, with the intent of eventually using something somewhere. Never had a, a plan for it, uh, but it was always uh, on the back burner that, that he and I would, would do a, a full-length project together. <clears throat> so that's, that's, uh, that's where the beats come from, anyway. Got it. Uh, what, what about really the concept? The concept, what really drove uh, the idea behind Victor Shade as it came to fruition, uh, was the inspiration from my late brother-in-law, Jimmy. Uh, this is a topic that I've, I've discussed and, and explored on, on Tobacco Road, uh, uh, common market albums uh, like The Winter's End. This topic of, of suicide is something that affects me uh, pretty profoundly. I lost my father to suicide when I was very young. Uh, and then losing my brother-in-law to suicide as well. Uh, provoked me to, to think about a whole lot of things uh, and to actually try and address the subject uh, in an accessible manner. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's difficult to talk about suicide. Uh, we don't do it at a, 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 a societal yeah, level. It's, it's taboo. It's, taboo. Huh? It's, it's very difficult to talk about suicide, I think, because of the Christian influence in the society. Because it's, we automatically presume that if you take your own life, you go to hell. If you're raised in the church, that's how you're taught to believe. And I think that has a, a very profound uh, influence on the way that our, our reluctance to talk about things like suicide. So it became a challenge for me to address the topic. Losing my, my father to suicide, losing my brother-in-law to suicide over the, the span of 30 years, they're both named Jimmy, which I thought was, was very interesting because I had addressed my father's suicide in songs in the past and, and actually referred to him as Jimmy. I was six years old when I lost my dad. So we didn't have a, a, a relationship, you know, so he's always been Jimmy to me. So there's that as well. Uh, before, uh, before my brother-in-law passed away, uh, he had, he had um, assigned different superheroes to people in his life. This is the part where I love it. it gets you. <laughs> this, this guy was, was heavy, heavy, heavy into comics. I mean, he lived in a Marvel universe. He really did. And uh, before he had passed, he, he told me, I'm the Vision. I had no idea what that meant or if there was any real significance to it. Um, didn't think much about it because I, I don't have much familiarity with comics, uh, with, with, with anything to do with comics, really. I've never read comics, don't really, uh, don't really know much about the characters and the role that they play, don't know anything about superpowers, uh, but I have an appreciation for it. There is an uh, inextricable connection between the comic universe and hip-hop mu music and culture. Uh, you've seen it in, in Wu-Tang, uh, predominantly, uh, uh, people like Cool Keith or people like MF Doom. I mean, there's really a, a, a close link between these two uh, cultures, but I'd never made the connection personally. Not until after losing Jimmy uh, did I uh, put some thought into it, did I do some research and find out what it was that motivated him to even undertake this, this task of assigning different superheroes to his friends and family before he died. And I think he did that consciously. I think he he told me what he needed to tell me before he left this world. Doesn't the vision like save the world through words? <clears throat> like, 
It's possible. I still maintain my ignorance for the, the comic <laughs> universe. Um, I, I don't know much about it, but what I do know is that the Vision is essentially an android, which is unlike most superheroes, which are mutants, right? Uh, the Vision was created by Henry Pym. He has the heart of the Human Torch. Uh, he was created, I think, initially to fight the West Coast Avengers and then ends up joining the West Coast Avengers. Now, this is where I started to make a real connection between me personally and, and this idea of a, a superhero, right? right? I'm born and raised in Kentucky, which identifies heavily in terms of hip-hop culture with East Coast hip-hop. Sure. So much so that, that when there was a split sometime around the, the very late 80s, early 90s, that East Coast, West Coast rivalry started to become... Uh, more prominent, we, we heavily identified with East Coast music and hated West Coast music. So there you go. You automatically have the East Coast, West Coast rivalry. Maybe I was born to fight the West Coast Avengers. <laughs> Lord knows, that I, I, I had no idea that I would ever end up living on the West Coast. I knew nothing about Seattle. There's, so there's a very, very rich emotional um, and culturally based significance to Victor Shade. If you, if you choose to read into it that way, sure. of course, but that's the thing. That's the personal connection that I'm making. Right. And that's what motivated me to do this Victor Shade project. I'm not telling everybody, uh, you know, <laughs> I am a superhero uh, and I'm struggling with this identity. I just want to be a regular guy. But that's, that's the, the fictional uh, product of, of what takes place in my head, right? Mm -hmm. That's what came out as Victor Shade. So, so I'll, I'll wrap it up by saying Victor Shade is the alter ego to the vision. Got it. That's where Victor Shade comes from. That is, uh, you know, Peter Parker to Spider-Man or Clark Kent to Superman. The, the alter ego, the real life regular guy. Before I, I go over to Charles just for a second, that's one of the things that I find is so interesting. And like, for example, right here, we're sitting here that the in a photographer, filmmaker form of bringing in cultural heroes. You've already brought in comics, um, you know, personal issues, um, East Coast, West Coast rivalry, all of that. As, as information moves a lot quicker, all that is, is becoming more and more a part of the fabric of the art that is created, whether you're in New York, in Seattle, Tokyo, London, or wherever. And that's, uh, that's what is impressed most upon me with the era that we're living in right now, specifically the projects that you're working on. And, and Charles is amazing at uniting all of those things from you know, your films and your writing to your amazing knowledge of hip hop. When you guys are gonna start talking about cra crazy hip hop stuff, I'm gonna have to step out. I mean, I, I'm, I know superficially, but <laughs> Charles, tell me a little bit about what your, your view on this and how, I mean, you've been, if I'm not mistaken, a huge fan of Roz ever since the first time you heard him. Yeah, you know, uh, first thing, you know, I, I always wanna figure out how you approach this huge question called hip hop and the people involved in it, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and when they make their art, what that art really means. In this, I mean, I, I go from the very small to the very large very quickly. I'm not, very, I'm not scared of that. And so uh, when I think of um, just this comment about going from the East Coast to the West Coast, um, coming from Kentucky, uh, the fact that you know, Tobacco Road, which was Common Market's uh, record released about two years ago now, um, a very successful, a really huge project. I mean, it was not small. I mean, it was, it was a real investigation of life I in Kentucky. I mean, uh, and what other forum allows that kind of flexibility, right? That you okay. can go and talk about uh, picking tobacco uh, in Kentucky and be white, mm -hmm. and it can be hip hop, right? And that to me is, me, I always say, well, what is hip hop then? Exactly. I mean, if, if, it, if it can just be so flexible, if it can go from here to there. I mean, right now, a few days ago, I was watching a movie called Imani. They have the Seattle Film Festival right now. And it's a long festival. It goes on for forever. And uh, I watch too many films during it. But there is a week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I love this. I mean, it's a great way to see the world. I mean, I hate to say it, uh, you know, um, uh, and... Uh, because all these films are, you will never see them again. They won't get distribution. The film industry is, 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 str is being strangled right now by the financial crisis. So more than ever, it's your chance to really see stuff. And so you go to this, I went to SIF and I watched a film called Imani. And it's set in Uganda and Kampala. And uh, uh, there was a, a rap, uh, there was a break dancer in the film. And I was, uh, it involved uh, dancing and hip hop in Kampala. And I was blown away. Here I am 
And this, you know, I call, I call hip hop a technology and they're using it right there and they're translating their experiences going between the rural and the urban, between the slums and the, uh, and the, and the posh neighborhoods, the colonial uh, legacy of that country, all being channeled through and processed in terms that are clearly hip hop. So this is to me, when I, when I, whenever I, I encounter uh, other rappers and I'm seeing they're doing a successful job at this processing, because that's what it is. I mean, can you process it well? Can you yeah. bring your culture, can you bring your history, your, your, ish, your, your situations, the tragedies in your life, mm -hmm. right? And it's not, I don't care about anybody's tragedy when I'm listening to hip hop, to be honest with you. I really don't. I, I, I feel for people, but if that hip hop is not good, the tragedy does not make a, yeah. a good hip hop. It just doesn't. And I'm sorry, a lot of people like to believe that you can just speak about something very deeply personal, but it has to be. Sure. It tragedy has to. in and of itself is not the mechanism by which. We to all use have it. tragedy. <laughs> Who doesn't? Right, right. Who, who doesn't have dead people behind them? I mean, right. <laughs> unless you're from the moon, right? right. I, don't, I don't think you can come from the moon. But anyway, um, the thing is, is that the, the thing is that is that is that what Ra has done so successfully. When I've noticed this from um, really um, uh, uh, from his work with uh, with um, Sabzi. Uh, to, which we're going to have to talk about pretty soon, but um, is that he's done a really excellent job at translating all of these experiences and his movements and his uh, and his place uh, in America into really good hip hop. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's it's, it's you know that's how it goes for me. That's that's almost my statement. That's a great things. artistic statement to come to the table with. Yeah, it absolutely. sounds very prepared. Yeah, as <laughs> <laughs> a writer, I guess. Coincidentally, it, there is one Baha'i temple on the entire continent of Africa, and it's in Kampala. I don't is know it? whether they they probably didn't cover that in the film, and it no, probably doesn't didn't. have any real relevance to to the film itself. Uh, but again, when you when you start to make these connections, when you make a conscious effort to do so, to start connecting the dots mm -hmm. for yourself, mm -hmm. you know, not not to to establish some global. Uh, government conspiracy, but when, yeah, yeah, when you start to connect the dots for your own self, uh -huh. then you start to see these things and recognize and, under, and, and, and appreciate the importance, I think. And I mean, really, Africa is a very large continent. I lived in Zambia for two years, and, and, and oftentimes when I tell people I lived in Zambia, they say, oh, you know, I know somebody who lives in, uh, <laughs> in Botswana, maybe right. you know them. Yes. <laughs> the American... <laughs> The American perspective yes. of Africa, many, still, many people believe Africa is a country, and, and they don't understand or appreciate the, the, sorry, the magnitude <laughs> of the, the geographic sure. impression of, of Africa. And, and again, one Baha'i temple on the entire continent, and it's in Kampala. So yes, there's hip hop there. There's also the Baha'i faith there. Yes. And both of those things are, are very important to me. That's, in, you know, um, I'm glad you brought that up because it takes a trip to Africa to realize how huge it is yeah. and also uh, the, how, how um, diverse it is. I mean, it's, there, the Kampala to me is as, is as foreign as, I mean, here, this movie gave me an access to it and I noticed similarities, but I had to see it. I, I have no idea what goes on in Kampala if, I, if nobody shows it to me. Yeah. Just because I, I, mean, I grew up in Harare doesn't mean I understand what, what's up in Kampala or Cairo or, uh, or uh, Lagos. I mean, they are as foreign to me sure. as Fairbanks, Alaska. Right, and sure. people don't understand this is what you're dealing with, and then they, they sort of they do they lump this huge continent together, and then um, you know and uh, but then you know uh, as I say, travel it makes the difference. You know if you you know if you travel, you will see uh, you will you will see the facts, and you'll change the way you see you yeah, know absolutely. think about them. Before living in Zambia, all I knew of the country was from the old Statsasonic song. Do you remember this oh, song? Oh, yes. Um, A-F-R-I-C-A. -A. Angola, Soweto, <laughs> Zimbabwe, <laughs> Tanzania, <laughs> Zambia, <And> Mozambique, <laughs> and Botswana. So let, let us speak, speak about, about the, the motherland. motherland. Speak about the motherland. <laughs> yeah, One see, of us does not know the lyrics. <laughs> you're talking about somebody who was, what, maybe 13, maybe 14 years old when I was listening to Statsasonic. That's all I knew of Zambia was from that song. Yeah. Didn't know a thing about the country. Well, 10 years know, later, I was living there with a wife and a child, you know? I mean, it's, it, 
Well, this is you have to start making the connections, right? Well, and, and speaking of connections, that's one of the things that's interesting for me personally as an artist is, I mean, look at what hip hop is, and you touched on it, Charles. It's this amazing amalgamation of so many parts of culture. There's African history, there's what's going, you mentioned East Coast, West Coast, there's the, the shallow history of hip hop and the recency, but it's obviously incredibly deep and someone from outside of the industry, I have not come up through the hip hop industry, but have can have such a deep appreciation for it. It can connect people in so many different ways. That's, it's a versatile yeah. music. Absolutely. Um, you know what, what? What's also very impressive. I want to say this as a sort of a last. I want to. I always like to move on beyond that point. But um, I'm. All, you know the, the the stuff going on in Kampala. They're rapping in their local language. They're not rapping in English. Sure, right. It's happening also in in, uh, in Soweto. It's also happening in Tokyo. They rap. They rap in Japanese and mm -hmm. French. The reason why hip hop is so popular and even supported so is because they, they they rap in French. They don't rap in. Um, it's beautiful. Yes, well. it's beautiful, and uh, and it's keeping their language alive. So in a way, I mean, instead of complete absorption, right. so this is an incredible piece of cultural software because it doesn't it doesn't seem to destroy what, what you're doing. It seems to accept it and allow you to mold it in, on the terms of your experience, mm -hmm. right? Otherwise, you'd be rapping in English, right? right. I mean, <laughs> if it was a complete takeover, right. you wouldn't be ret returning people or returning. Uh, 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 <clears throat> The art wouldn't come back to us with completely new uh, possibilities, such as another language, other um, registers, other rhythms, and so on and so on. It is. So, very, it's very much like uh, an open source language yeah. technology, absolutely, where, where everyone's adding to it and dividing it and sharing it and remixing it and remaking it. It's, I haven't thought of it as software before. Oh, technology. I've always, oh yeah, it's brilliant. That's, brilliant. Uh, that's been always been my, my 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 opinion. It's a piece of cultural technology mm -hmm. that you can share and you can use, and uh, it's open to everybody, mm -hmm. right? And look what's happened. And look how how well it's spread. So I mean, it's always a model for for uh, for business for me, or not for for an economy. Sure. An economy of uh, of, uh, of of open of open uh, of open software. You know. Brilliant. So. Culturally, I think it does still require some form of assimilation, or, or at least adaptation, right? I mean, yeah. um, sure, uh, I, th I think hip hop makes, hip hop as a culture, hip hop as a, a genre of music, however you choose to define it, um, yes, the path is wide enough to accommodate all, right? It is, you could, you could bring anything that you want to the art form, or to the culture, and you're encouraged to do so. But at the point where you start utilizing the art form uh, to express yourself, there are some standards, right? right. Okay. And, and that, gets back, that gets back to the very first point that you that's made. Right. It's got to be good. Yep. Mm -hmm. It really does have to be good. Yes, that's right. And, and globally, I think we're, we're still trying to advance to that, that level, you know, where globally people are making good hip-hop music. And it's circulating. And certainly the Internet is, is, uh, is going to be such a valuable right. tool, uh, not only for distribution of music, but, but even for the creation of music. If people are able to download the software, I mean, hardware is, is one issue, mm. but that's becoming more and more available. Uh, sure, it's not been fully democratized, but it's we're, we're, it's, it's it's in pe access. Right people sure. people are having more and more access to the hardware necessary to create music, right? And then with the ability to download software, some of it free, some of it illegal. However, it happens. Accessibility. Yeah, well, most of it's going to live up here in the not too distant future, and people are just going to use little teeny devices. To, to plug into it. So sure, it, people are already shooting uh, you know, videos with the, the, the camera right. phones and whatnot. Right. And they, they come out looking who did not that so bad. Yeah, who did that in Seattle? Don uh, Def. Don Def did it walking down Pike. Yeah, and it was, it was brilliant. It <laughs> yes, was beautiful. It was, it was well done. You guys remember the songs reading, drinking uh, hip hop thing that we had here? Yes, where, that's right. Where uh, basically it was a gathering uh, for the folks at, at, at home. It was a gathering of Seattle's hip-hop community. I think, Charles, you call it the most important night in hip-hop history in Seattle, I think, something like that. Yeah, well, because there were just, I, I, my, one of my things was that if you dropped a bomb that night, you'd pretty much have <laughs> <laughs> wiped out all eradicated, <laughs> eradicated Seattle hip-hop. Would, but would, it, the, the, the thing that struck me was that, that MCs were writing um, rhymes on their phones while others were standing up and delivering rhyme a cappella, you know? Sure. Yeah. I think that was incredible. That's that cultural adaptation that you're seeing. Right. That's, that's just straight mimicry mm -hmm. is what that is, really. I mean, it, there's a certain functionality to actually writing your raps on your Blackberry, but come on. I mean, a lot of it is for effect. Sure. You know, you stand up and deliver the rhyme from your, your Blackberry. I mean, come on. <laughs> well, you know, has, 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 I mean, 
Here, here's something that I, I always think about a little bit, is that you, you can always, um, is that I'm impressed that even to this day, I mean, hip hop's been around for 30 years, and um, it's, the way it starts and the tools it uses, the it, procedures are such that they're still useful. They still, they still make sense with all the technological changes that have happened in 30 years. And that to me is quite impressive. I mean, right now, a lot of music forms kind of either it's, it's you know, it's, it's change or die. Mm -hmm. And yet there's this sort of inherent mutability in the form that it, because things change fast, mm -hmm. it knows how to, it, it can change with them and almost weirdly remain the same. I have, that's been the mystery for me. Like, how is it possible so late in the game that, that you and uh, others can just still make these adjustments and thrive under these new strange um, technological environments, mm -hmm. you know? And, and, I, and I know your, your new album, it has differences and sure. it is a lot more, um, I think it's a lot more, um, uh, we'll go into that, we'll go into that. I want to talk to you about that in a second. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, I mean, you're talking about a culture whose, whose backbone is really, you know, like, a, you, you could do this with it, right? Just, that's, that's, I mean, you make the beat on the table or you beatbox, you know, I mean, you take this thing with you. And so the ability to transform and adapt and, and make something out of nothing, I mean, that's, isn't that, isn't that really where it comes from? So, so yeah, bring on any tools, invent something, we'll figure out how to use it. Is that how you the started? idea behind sampling, absolutely. To, to describe it, I'd like to know. The, the early origins yeah, of- Were you of, tapping on the table and getting everybody upset? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> I, I eat some your of the, food. Yeah, some of the <laughs> earliest memories that I have, uh, you know, are rapping in the hallways at Centerfield Elementary, uh, fifth grade, fifth grade. And uh, me and a friend of mine, uh, we actually, we, we called our crew Chaos, K-A-O-S. Me, him, adaptation there. and a beatboxer <laughs> That's right. who was a black female fourth grader. She introduced me to the Fat Boys. Shannon Gathright was her name. She was SMG, then we had DOC, and I was RMC. Whoa. I'm talking fifth grade, man. <laughs> wow. We didn't even write our own stuff. We would just rap LL Cool J's yeah, you know, I was stuff. wondering who. Ice-T stuff. Ice-T, LL. Six in the morning, police at my door. Double. Fifth grade, man. A couple of white dudes and a black beatboxer. Chaos. That's how it started. So yeah, we could make beats on the table. Um, I, by the time that I was in seventh or eighth grade, I started to amass, much to my mother's dismay, uh, a collection of, of studio equipment, just piece by piece. And I had an old Akai sampler, uh, you know, with a, the keyboard controls. And That's right. I mean, just a, I had a, a Lisa SR16 drum machine that I would use to make the beats. Um, and it was very crude, but I still have some of that music that I, that I was making even in middle school and then on into high school. Uh, we would do talent shows. We performed at the county fair. Honest to God, like this is some, this is just some weird shit, man. Like this is something nobody else had done. You don't rap at the Oldham County Fair, you know. I mean, like right after the beauty contest and just before they they judge the sheep, you know. <laughs> Honest to God, we're it's up there like rapping. Napoleon Dynamite, they're judging the udder structure on the cows, and then <laughs> I know we're I know that my homie that. Deuce is out there watching right now. Deuce, pay attention because he'll want me to tell this part of the story. There were four acts in the talent show. We didn't place. <laughs> They gave a third, <laughs> third place, second player, a runner up, and, and grand prize. And uh, I think the message was pretty clear. <laughs> we don't like rap. Right? <laughs> that's LaGrange, Kentucky, just outside of Louisville. Wow. Louisville's, Louisville. That's how my people call it. Not yeah. full of marbles there. Louisville. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, so that's, that's kind of the, that's a, a, a brief summary of the early origins. But yeah, making something out of nothing, or you know, just trying to grab a, a, a piece of equipment here and make do with it, uh, it worked. It really worked because it's it's what compelled me to keep creating music in the future. There's, I'm gonna try and make a kind of a global connection here. There's something where where you can. There's something to be said for things that can come from nothing. Um, yeah. Like as you Jesus had a lot to say about <laughs> those things. <laughs> well, what you're talking about specifically is tapping on the and, and uh, three elementary school kids. And you know a beatbox, no, no real instruments. Uh, think, think of soccer. We're about to start the World Cup. Yeah. All it takes to play that is a ball. Accessibility. Yeah, accessibility. That's that's what that's the key to global uh, connection, mm -hmm. connectivity, or or uh, the ability to relate is accessibility. Mm -hmm. And this is what strikes me. And I'm, I'm, I'm no, I just no, want to make this point, and then no, we'll, no, we'll no, finish no, it's it. With, beautiful. Okay. I'll um, make one more point. You, there's no race for points. That's the beautiful thing about this format here is that we're not limited. Uh, the Lair show is 30 minutes long. This can be as long <laughs> as it wants to be. Um, there is a dissolution of, of the middle class in hip hop. Um, but I think at the same time, there is a, a growing 
base of the underclass in hip hop. Um, and, and that has a lot to do with what you were saying about uh, you know, soccer ball, mm -hmm. right? I mean, if, if this is all you have, you'll make do with it. Mm -hmm. And if you want access to it, you'll get it, mm -hmm. you'll find it, you will make your way in, you'll play ball Absolutely. with this. Uh -huh. Meanwhile, at the, uh, you know, at, the, uh, at the advanced level of, of uh, materialistic, uh, corporate-driven hip-hop music, the, the, the only hip-hop music that continues to make money. I mean, there's Jay-Z, there's Kanye, there's not a whole lot, right? And, and it's going further and further this way. Right. I mean, really, anybody who is successful in rap right now is only rapping about money. And, and, and so I think you might have something to say about that. We'll get into that, yeah, of sure. course. But, and, and I don't mean to just trivialize the issue. This is not just a rap versus hip-hop discussion. This is, not, uh, yeah, yeah. this is not bling bling. That, sure. We are way, way that's, past that's that. Tired, yeah. That's tired, That is an old, old discussion. But what we're talking about is a strong middle class. Uh, in any culture, you have to have a strong middle class, right? That's going away in hip-hop. So we'll, we'll figure out what to do about that. Well, you know, um, there's two, two things. One is um, the night that you, we had the hip hop dinner here, yeah. uh, Mad Rad started smashing the tables yeah. and uh, got a beat going. And I always remember, I mean, just out of nothing, you know. There wasn't even food on the table yet. <laughs> right. No, 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 that was interesting because we, we I mean, the, the whole, the whole, uh, I mean, Michael Hebb, my partner in that project, and I talked about it, and, and we host these dinners uh, where we bring musicians together, and they, the nights are usually quite predictable. Um, there's always something unique, some, you know, interesting things happen. You know, Pearl Jam plays with the Saturday nights for, <laughs> or something, you know, yeah. things that you don't expect. But one thing in particular with the, the, the hip-hop night was that the hip-hop community owned that night we were merely facilitators. Usually we're saying, okay, and, you know, and who's gonna, you know, we're just tapping people, who's gonna go next, and what song is it, are you gonna bring, and how can we, and this community, the, the hip hop community, completely took over. And I just stood back and, and let it unfold. And that, to me, is significant. It's, it's incredibly culturally relevant with what hip hop has had to do to invent itself and to reinvent itself and to grow and flourish. And it was a, it was a little microcosm of that happening. It was, it was amazing, like, like you said. They didn't ask if they could bang on the tables. You know, Sabzi didn't ask if he could drop a 20 minute beat to start the thing off with. It was just ownership. And I, I love that aspect of, of hip hop music. Yeah, you know, um, I always like to, uh, my background is such that I take history very seriously. And uh, in, in hip hop, uh, there's a curious moment um, in the late 70s. And I always like to bring people back to this, 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 this situation in New York City. Basically, you have massive budget cuts, education is slashed. Um, New York City went broke in 1975. Gerald Ford says, screw you, New York, right? I mean, we're not going to bail you out. Mm -hmm. Public services are cut. This is the situation. This is, where, this is what hip hop comes out of. Basically, there's nothing. There's absolutely uh, the, no commitment to, um, to the poor, to the underclass. And um, we live in a world right now, and I want, to, I want you to have that in mind. And we live in a world right now where often we're told we need, we need to have things to get things started. This is sort of it's the so world we, 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 we're often, this is, this is the kind of commercial, commercial environment uh, uh, that, 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 that you have to, that you have to have these means, you have to have this investment made, you have to have, go, to make money. Yeah, yeah, it takes money to make money, and all this stuff, right? As if you, as a human being, stripped of all the things that you own, would stop creating, right? And I always think that everybody go back to 1979, look at the Bronx, right? Roger Moses, Robert Moses, the, uh, the uh, you know, who was, who was pretty much tearing up the whole city, right, and transforming it sure. into the sort of Manhattan, into the Manhattan we have today. Um, you know, sends an expressway right through the Bronx, displaces all sorts of cultures, right? Jewish cultures, black cultures, uh, Latino cultures, all of them removed or decimated, reduced to rubble, right? And literally, this is yeah. literally, yeah, there, there is. If you see the images, they're kind of startling. Right. Everybody calls it uh, an H bomb it dropped on uh, New York City at the time, at least those neighborhoods. And this is where hip hop really comes from. 
right? And, and, and a, 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 um, a, an area of, um, I want to say a, a, an abandoned area, but I'm, you know, I'm looking for a better word. Sure. But uh, when you see that, and you see that still, even with nothing, mm -hmm. no state support, and by the way, no business support, no one's right. there, no, businesses don't support. open, right. state doesn't show up to pick up your trash, and still, you make music under these conditions. Right. You know, this is to me the remarkable thing. And I always have to rem remind people, like, don't get swept up about the way you, what you think your limitations are today. And, and don't, get, don't get caught up in them. In right. photography and filmmaking, we, we talk about it a lot. Oh, the, yes. the, the, the constraints, and, and just in creativity in general, I believe, and that's why it's a great segue from what you were just saying, the, a limitation, a constraining of the creative individual actually will create better results or more interesting results where you have to make something out of nothing or have to make something with less. As a, you can travel around the world and, and have a photo shoot crew with you know, 40 people and every piece of equipment you can possibly have. And, and you know what? At the end of the day, I've probably made better pictures with a 2 megapixel, a 3 megapixel camera on the walk between my house and my coffee shop in the morning. And the constraining, and actually that, that technology constraint was something that had opened my eyes up. And when you think about you know, the, the similar thing that happened in the roots of hip hop, I think we can probably say that a lot of great art has been made by constraining the inputs and, and allowing people to really generate something spectacular as an output. Yeah. I think that's why Detroit is on top right now, at least uh, in Detroit. terms of hip hop. You know? oh, even in terms that's of tech, that's, that's a great point, actually. Oh, no. The place is, is empty. There are a hundred skyscrapers that don't have a single office in them. And the music community there. really good music right yeah, now. Yeah, but they have been for a long time. Sure. Do you know, I mean, I mean, even post um, Motown, right, uh, which was a sort of glory, that, that moment was great music, great economy, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but the moment of techno. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, I remember Techno City came out and they were talking about a futuristic city. I mean, this is Model 500. Yeah. And you're hearing this idea of Techno City and they're like describing it as sleek. And you're wondering, oh my gosh, <laughs> where, where are they? This is not Detroit that I hear about in the news. Yeah. Where are they seeing this Detroit? And I just love the fact that, that, that the imagination just took over. If you can't see Techno City, well, we'll have to create it through the cultural uh, 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 software that we have. So anyway, yeah, no, no, I, I love the Detroit. And yeah, Detroit is doing well. And, you know, so is Seattle. I mean, to me, Seattle is another situation where, you know, of course, I mean, yeah, I don't know, but we're doing that badly in terms of the recession. But for some reason, the past five years in Seattle have been quite uh, exciting. Musically, just Musically, very, very, very exciting. Right, right. This is not to diss the old cats. I mean, we have a, we have a history in Seattle of hip-hop that extends sure. pretty much, you know, to uh, so mix a lot to the... Um, to the early to mid '80s, uh, when they used to have what's it called, street, street, street sounds, street sounds. Yeah, on, I was uh, when we used to KCMU. Yeah. I don't know what it's called. Now. KXP on KXP. Well, yeah. yeah, they're still doing street sounds. It used to be Rap Attack back on KCMU. Oh, that's so what it was. It was Rap, Rap Attack. Rap Attack. Yeah. Well done yeah, to street sounds. Yes. And now Larry is actually continuing on that that tradition yeah. that, that B Mello left and and others before him. Um, yeah, it's it, it's true. The past five years have. I, Basically, I think what it, what it boils down to is, is people are paying more attention, uh, specifically uh, those with positions of, of power or privilege, um, may, uh, primarily speaking about media, people at The Stranger, people at KEXP. Uh, these people are covering local hip-hop. They're playing local hip-hop. Uh, they're letting other people know what's happening in the local hip-hop community. That's something that, that didn't exist to this degree back before, uh, well, certainly uh, pre-millennium, but, but really not much before 2004 and 2005. And, and I think that's important to say, even though you might not have understood anything I just said, yeah. uh, what I'm saying is to say that the past five years have, have been a defining moment in Seattle hip hop history is not to negate what came before. It's not to say that what's being produced now is better than what was being produced then. People are paying attention. We're getting radio play, and that, that makes a huge difference. Uh, you know, groups like Common Market or Blue Scholars are still not getting radio play on Cube. This is corporate radio, right. and they're still so much bound to a national format. Uh, they don't have the liberties of, of programming like KEXP does. Right. Uh, 
so we're still not getting radio play on a station like Cube, which I, th I think would change things. This is not an appeal for corporate radio play, but I'm just saying it certainly would change things, even in, here in our city. Well, think, let, me, let me dive in just for one second. Mm -hmm. and, and there is something interesting that's going on with KEXP's move to New York as well, with Radio New York. Um, you know, you get the John Richards going over there and sticking his roots in, and there, like, that is a way that the Seattle music scene, you know, don't talk about grunge, talk about hip hop and electronic, because both those things are coming out of Seattle really good, that we are getting somewhat of a, a foothold in a New York right now, which is, you know, I, I, I'm, I find admirable about the things. Scholars that, are selling out shows in New York. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's happened, so I think it's fair to say, yeah, if they, they play a show at Bowery or wherever it was that they, they play a show in New York, right. I mean, they're, they're bringing people out. So yeah, people, there is a connection, which is important. Uh, but again, some people just never had that opportunity, and, and it is unfortunate. I feel very blessed, feel privileged to have been a part of the, the Seattle, the second Seattle hip-hop wave, as Charles defines it, mm -hmm. uh, right around 2005. Um, and, and if it wasn't for me being in the right place at the right time and aligning with the right people, I wouldn't be able to do the Victor Shade project. I mean, I'd still be able to do it in terms of access. People would have a very different perception of it. It's a third wave hip hop. Third wave. Uh, and that's a great, great deal. You know, one of the things. Um, I might be the only MC in Seattle who's able to ride multiple waves. Is that is that is that fair to say? <laughs> hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna go for fourth and fifth. All right. In I my forties. And that's one of the things that I love about you. I mean, there's, uh, you've performed a private concert um, that I was at, and it was just like. There was five thousand people in the room, except there was fifty, and you sent it so hard. There's a, it's really fun to watch how much you love the art that you're creating and want to share it because mm -hmm. the people on the other side of it, we, we feel it. The the writing multiple waves and Victor Shade that just came up. Um, we're starting to get a lot of questions online here, and I'm I'm gonna grab one which was, um, it's from from Garrett Gibbons, and again, if you want to write in, uh, do so at via Twitter and use hashtag CJ live. Um, what, what, what Garrett asked is, um, why is Victor Shade sans label? And uh, <laughs> what do you think about that? Sure, yeah, uh, why, don't, why don't you tackle this one first? Because for me to speak on it uh, would be pointless. Without label? Yeah, well, what, what's the... Uh, does anybody worry about labels anymore? <laughs> I, and I'm quite What's serious about that. I think I, I got mean, a label back serious. here in my shirt I mean, somewhere. labels are yeah. fine, but I, 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 it sort of amazes me. I, I don't... It used to be uh, uh, 20 years or 10 years ago, yeah. uh, labels were vital to the survival of, a, of any project. Right. Um, I'm, and, and right now, half the albums that I really enjoy are not attached to, to right. record labels. They're just not. And if I don't use a record label anymore as a measure uh, for what I'm listening to, I mean, there's some great record labels out there, um, 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 you know, Stone's Throw Records uh, in LA and, and 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 others. I mean, but I I, I don't buy a record because uh, oh, yeah. I, I don't download a record. I never. I don't even know which label. I don't know if it's a, it has a label or not. I don't know if I'm the only one who buys things that way. Mm -hmm. I just no. like something now, right. and I just go and figure out how do you get it, you know. And um, uh, it is, you know, uh, you know usually. Um, I try to buy it, and right. uh, and uh, and if that's there, you know that, that's how it works. I, I really, as a critic, mm -hmm. I, and I do review hip hop records um, from you know from around the country. Sure, I, Village I, Voice I, yeah. and, and Time Out New York, and, and, sure. and so but so on. And I don't, you know, sure. Again, as I, I'll repeat this. I mean, there are some labels that do have a reputation. Um, you know, of Seattle, uh, recently was attached very closely to the Rhyme Sayers in Minneapolis and things like that. So, so you know, you had Grace Gull coming out of that label. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think Vitamin D was also attached to that label as well. Jake One as well. And Jake One just released, package. yeah, with Freeway. I mean, there is. So he's there. Yeah, you're acknowledging the fact that it does still serve a role, serve a purpose. P purpose, uh, yeah. Yeah, there, there, is a, there is a purpose for, for labels to continue to exist on multiple levels. Mm -hmm. uh, and to, to answer Garrett's question, who, by the way, was the director of the, uh, the first and only Victor Shade video, the one right. for Soothsayer. Uh, Garrett's a fantastic filmmaker. Um, the active pursuit of a label is not something that we're, uh, we're chasing after right now, uh, we being me and MTK. Uh, both of us have uh, connections. We have, uh, uh, we have a, a broad network of folks who are 
connected to record labels, both major and independent. Uh, and neither one of us would be averse to the idea of establishing a relationship with a label, but it's for the, the, the purpose of support in various forms. Not, not choosing the direction, but supporting the direction. It, exactly. Right. It, has, it has a lot less to do with, with branding now, I think, in terms of a, a marketing strategy, but it's right. more about marketing ability. Yeah. Um, and, and these things are still important. Seattle is very much deprived of a management network. Um, you know, we spent, we collectively, this, this, this Seattle hip hop culture, we spent so much time and energy teaching young kids how to break dance and teaching them how to DJ or teaching them how to write raps. We did all these seminars. I mean, really, for the sure. past five years, a lot of this community outreach stuff that we talk about, you know, is, is going into schools or to, to clubs or teen centers and, and giving workshops, right? right? But we haven't taught right. anybody how to manage groups. Right. You know, this is really important. And so we don't oh, wow. have yeah. that solid infrastructure in Seattle. When we talk about management companies in Seattle, it's a few people, right. really. It's, there's not a broad network of management uh, happening in Seattle. And so we do look to, to labels still. Right. And I think, uh, like Scholar's relationship with not only Cafe... Uh, Cafe... Vita. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, oh, I blew it for you? No, 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 no. <laughs> Cafe Vita as well as Duck Down. You know, this is a, sure. a symbiotic relationship, and it's working well. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, you know, fact, could they achieve the same thing without the, that support? You know, probably, but it's it's a different mechanism. It's I, I've actually I've shown an interest in that for some time, and I'm talking to a handful of different groups about acting in a similar fashion. And the idea of supporting music through a means of just connecting them with a larger audience, yeah. rather than dictating all of the things that are a, are a part of the message. Uh, and, and playing that kind of that secondary role is really intriguing to me um, when I think about how I want to spend some of my time or resources it would be to facilitate that stuff so mm -hmm. if the question you know uh, go back and going back to Garrett's question is like why didn't you do it it's because you don't have to really it's not a requirement I mean you know the 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 canon the machine that used to make art and, and, and put it out into the world, you, you used to, as an artist, require permission from that machine. Mm -hmm. And now permission is not required by anybody. In a few minutes' time, you can have the mechanisms for distribution and for sharing your ideas online. And if it's good, they will come. And this yeah. is the first time in the history there's, of the world that that... There's the qualifier, that, yeah. Yeah. if it's good. If it's yeah, good. If it's good. But you know, even the paper I work for, The Stranger, um, our model has changed. Um, well, I'm not surprised that there is a duck down uh, Cafe Vita, a cafe and a record label collaboration yeah. for the distribution of that record. That sounds normal to me now. Mm -hmm. Anybody who thinks that that looks, sounds odd is in trouble. Right? right? Anybody who thinks that that's kind of funky. Things are changing. You're, you're gone. Oh. You're going to be, yeah. Yeah, you're going to be. Yeah, I'm having, I'm having uh, you know, huge companies, Fortune 500 companies and, and ad agencies coming to, to say, here is our product. And the creative brief says, what do you want to do? this brand will enable you to make what it is that you want to make. And that the message is going to be that they're enabling you. That's and, right. Like, and, and from a, as an artist, that's amazing. It's that amazing, and it's that unique crossover from commercial art to fine art. And I'm going to continue to talk in the, you know, this next year about the disintegration between those two lines because now when a corporation is willing to put some money behind it with no strings attached. Mm. It's, yeah, it's starting to get interesting. Important. It is, but it's starting to get interesting. Talk to me, I, I, I feel like you, I got the sense that when we first kicked this thing off that you wanted to, to uh, kind of drill down a little bit into some of Ra's recent history and yeah. kind of look at where he's going. I was wondering if you could take us on that journey. Well, you know, okay. Um, uh, as a critic at The Stranger, uh, we... Uh, he pretty much uh, you know, started writing about the scene. Mm -hmm. There wasn't, in Seattle, there was a, a grunge scene that was, not a grunge scene, I'd, I'd say indie rock scene at that time, um, you know, from, uh, from Modest Mouse on down uh, uh, to, to what, what's going on today. Um, sure. And uh, that, that was thriving. It's always thriving. It's been doing very well. In fact, I always loved and always admired how committed a lot of the young people were to their bands in this town. Yeah. And there wasn't really, and, and then again, there's an infrastructure for that, for that relationship between the, uh, the rock 
in the Iraq community and and the uh, the, the, the producers and the, uh, and the and the consumers. Sure. And there wasn't really that, as he pointed out, for for hip hop. And so around around the, the start of the O's, we began to write about. There's actually a guy called Brian Getty who uh, used to write for The Rocket. And actually, oh, Brian wow. Getty was the first person. The Rocket was the big indie sure. paper here. And he was the first person to really write about the indie scene. Mm -hmm. And I sort of caught it in the, in, the, in, the, in the Rocket. I sort of caught it while I was writing for The Stranger. said, we should do this, too. And so I started writing about, uh, about hip hop. And then he came and joined us at The Stranger. And we started building this language, this way to talk about what's going on. And um, one of the bands that we sort of saw as we're going along, this is, it takes a while to develop this, 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 this relationship. Voice, well, yeah. one of the early bands, um, one was, 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 of course, Blue Scholars. And that was, um, that was uh, Gio and Sabzi. And uh, that was you know, quite amazing uh, that, 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 that if there wasn't a structure to communicate to the community, I mean, that would have probably just slipped and gone back into, into the ether. I mean, okay. who would have known? But then suddenly people started writing about it all over. I mean, people just, there was a lot more writing going on. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it stuck. It worked. People started paying attention. And then soon after that, he comes along, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Out of, I mean, he's been, you were doing a lot of stuff, right? I mean, you, you had already released a, a CD the year before, mm -hmm. and you were really just working, getting, getting, getting uh, uh, all the pieces together and, 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 and uh, establishing a reputation. Um, in, in the city, and then he released a common market, and it was it just exploded. It was quite amazing, and then everybody knew that. And then, and then followed other acts as well, and then it, it just was a surge, and everybody knew uh, everything had changed. And so, um, and I, I, love, I, I gotta say that like everybody knew that something had changed, and there there have been a couple of those markers, and yeah. for me, again, not completely saturated in the hip hop market, but as, as a hip hop appreciator. I, I, even me, someone on the outside, felt that change. Yeah. And, and it was a change definitely in and around the Blue Scholar when Common Market really started getting traction. It was so, so, um, you could feel it, you could smell it, you know, it was in the air. That's because it smelled like hippies. That's, <laughs> that's what it was. Well, I'm glad you guys also brought global justice to, to the house. You brought it, you made it a subject for hip hop. Which is great because right. that was uh, never heard anybody just you know I mean just talk about what be philosophical, right. you know deeply self-reflective and then be strongly attached to uh, global issues you know uh, uh, fair trade um, the way the way we spend money uh, neoliberalism and all of these things came and uh, it was a, quite a it was quite a uh, 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 you know I want to I'm always looking for words as a writer. I'm, Always looking for words, <laughs> and you know, mind. yes, I know. And then, and again, whatever what it was, I think it might have been too much, too fast. Why did you say that? <laughs> because we had a mixed reaction um, amongst a, a very broad demographic. Uh, it became soapbox rap. It became the epitome of conscious backpack rap, which is a term that had uh, carried over from the oh, mid '90s. Yes. We can get ironically, conscious yeah, backpack yeah, conscious backpack rap. Again, ironically, which is something that, that Brand Nubian really, I think, takes credit for, yeah. for being at the fore of, especially, you know, Grand Puba. I mean, that was literally, that was some early backpack rap, right? And it was conscious. I thought it was Black Moon. Was sort of my the back, idea. Well, sure, yeah. yeah. And then they all come out of the same vein, I yes, think. But, that's right. but anyway, what happened was there, there started to become a, uh, uh, an influx of white folks who were rapping. Uh, and then when you started to, to rap about, uh, you know, conscious political stuff, it, it took on a, a whole new connotation. And for some people, it just didn't sit well. And I get that. I understand it. For the, so, can so I, as, as, can I ask a question as, as someone who's on the outside and who, for whom that resonated? And that's, you know, we're talking to a really broad audience online today about sure, yeah, a, yeah. a, a, a cross-section. It's mostly made up of, of independent creatives, but the, that is what... That's the thing that brought me really to the table where the rubber was meeting the road was that mm -hmm. it was bigger than than hip hop than hip hop or bigger yeah. than this town. Not it doesn't fall outside of hip hop because hip hop is so elastic and kind of accommodates so many things, but that it was bigger than the messaging that I I was familiar with in in uh, the traditional hip hop sphere. And uh, there was a a, a, a self awareness and a cultural awareness in it that I hadn't heard before. Yeah. 
you know, I'm going to make a point here. S Seattle's always been a little interesting. I'm not sure um, if this is fair for, say, to, uh, somewhere like Minneapolis, which I think is close to Seattle, and also something like Def Jax. I think this is, but Seattle in the mid 90s, um, a K Records, right, out of Olympia, um, who were you know, released back, and, mm -hmm. you know, of course, I mean, they're legendary. I mean, they actually were releasing hip hop. It just nobody noticed it. Right. And so there was this already this interesting relationship between underground hip hop and the indie rock scene. And I think that that's actually deeper than a lot of people really know or recognize. And, and um, again, I, as you, I think the bigness you're talking about was suddenly um, there were all these tools these, that, that were available to a variety of people mm -hmm. and to connect things and make it f feel bigger right. than it was before, whereas before it was harder to, these are more sort of isolated incidences. Although they're very interesting, right. there just was no, there was no internet to begin with right. in, in the way we have it today. Sure. I mean, just to, be honest, just to be frank, I know everybody says, oh, the internet changed everything, but it actually kind of did. <laughs> No, I mean, you know, Man, and it's not a cliche. Old, I mean, right. it's a cliche that's true. Right. You know, I mean, it's hard to get around and say, well, it wasn't the radio. <laughs> it wasn't the, it wasn't the carrier pigeon. Yeah, it wasn't, you know. It was, it was exactly the internet and also everybody taking a lot more seriously the content of the internet. I mean, I'm right. going to say one quick thing. Um, I, I'm also an academic. And I remember in the 90s, nobody took anything seriously if you, in, on, on, on academic terms if it was on the web. Right, they still de they still depended on journals, and in a way, they still do. Sure. But these days, you can do all of your research, and no one will think you right. a, a lesser person, a low a low creature for re right. resorting to the internet to to, to to take your information. And so there's this massive change, and so I think that happens at all levels, where now people do take seriously hip hop that it makes its appearance and is distributed and circulated on the web, and that was important for Seattle. I think it was an important for art in general because I, I'm hearing now from museums and galleries through the online channel, and and right. I, I mean those arguably are some of the most conservative and and protective institutions in our country, a museum, and if they're out there scouring and finding what something like myself or one of you guys is doing, and there that that is a justifiable reason for them to connect and reach out, boy, that is a sign that we have. You know, we've crossed the threshold. Yes, we have. And that, and that was 2005. And I think it's really important. I think it's very significant that all of these economic factors are, mm -hmm. are aligned. And suddenly we do have in Seattle a, a new, a new, a new um, influx of, uh, of talent. Right. right? You've got to remember, people are coming. You're coming into Seattle, right? I'm mm -hmm. coming into Seattle. We're all immigrants, pretty much. I mean, I, I know a lot of people come from Seattle. But a lot of the people who are doing stuff were coming from out of Seattle and bringing what they, right. what they had and connecting. To all of the uh, to all the networks, be they event networks or uh, label networks or so and so on, and and I just you just saw this happen, and um, and it was wonderful because it wasn't you weren't rapping about Seattle. I mean, you, you had sure. you had some raps that were sort of and pretty subtle focused, yeah, right. to, to Seattle, but there was a lot it of wasn't stuff. Wasn't Seattle centric? It wasn't Seattle centric, mm -hmm. and that was another Thinking important Hill. thing. You know, was that, that was just by virtue of the fact that the music was being created on uh, right. on Beacon Hill. I mean, right. we recorded that first Common Market album in. Uh, Sobs and Geo's attic, right. you know, on Beacon Hill. That that place was 110 degrees when we recorded that whole album. Uh, I mean, yeah, we, it's so hot. We yeah, <laughs> we really labored over that whole process. It was yeah. Let me let me let me park us in, in Seattle for a second, and, and we've made some references to some other cities, mm -hmm. um, and and actually there's some, a lot of questions coming in about oh, this this topic you. particularly. You know, we've already talked about what's going on. We, we've mentioned Minneapolis. We got Brother Ali. We got Slug. We got there's a lot of people. We've mentioned the Bay, which my my kind of understanding, and again from a from a somewhat of an ignorant perspective, that's really cooled off. It seems to me to have cooled oh, off. Definitely cooled off. And, and, as far as I'm concerned. But and then we're talking about Detroit, and uh, so um, Christopher Stamper is writing in. He's wanting to know a little bit about what's going on in Detroit. If you guys can comment on that a little bit. I mean, the best thing I could say is like, you know, go back to, uh, go back to uh, Tribe's, one of Tribe's last albums, The Love Movement, and, and check for Dilla's production around that, that time period of Tribe Called Quest, Love Movement, and then follow, track Dilla's production up until the time of his death, you know, through more of the slum village work and, uh, and De La Soul and, and uh, so much of that native tongues uh, era and, and type music. Start from there. And then let it take you all the way to like Royce the Five Nine. You'll you'll get uh, a check out. Yeah, it's a journey, and 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 again, it's it's almost like 
making that comparison about what Common Market is doing versus what somebody like Don Daff is doing. Like, they're created in the same space. They're influenced by a lot of the same factors, but the end product is so much different because it's about that process. How do you process it, right? Um, check for black milk. Um, I mean, there's so many, I, I, you know, and I, I'm never able to, to recall sure, properly and, and put people onto the, the right people. But, but yeah, Detroit hip hop is beautiful right now. Like it, it's real, it's tangible. Like it's, it, I, again, I think Detroit in terms of like which city in the United States is, is hot right now. And that's so important in hip hop. Like what's <laughs> hot right now? Who's hot right now? Detroit really is on top. So it's Philadelphia. Philly, yeah. yeah. You know, and it, LA, it's yeah. funny. Like, we'll, we'll talk more about like what, it, in the context of this discussion, you know, like uh, what is the Seattle hip hop sound? That's a, a, a concept that gets tossed around so often and, and so many people want to ask, uh, what is that definitive Seattle hip hop sound? There's not one. And, and there's, there's such a laborious discussion uh, about why that is or how do we solve it or who is it that we're going to rally behind to promote as the Seattle representative, our, our one Seattle delegate, right? Our hip hop delegate. Um, Look at other cities, look at places like Chicago. Like how many rappers can you name out of Chicago? Maybe a handful. How many rappers can you name out of Washington, D.C.? Wale. Maybe Tabi Bonet as well, but a lot of people aren't familiar with Tabi Bonet. That guy is phenomenal. But D.C. makes great hip hop music. How many rappers can you name out of Boston? I'm, I'm talking major label successful, uh, you know, uh, rappers that, you, that, that get mainstream exposure, sure. that type of thing. These are major cities in the United States that are still possibly struggling to put somebody on or to have a representative. So it doesn't really say anything negative about Seattle as a city or as a community or sure. as a culture or whatever that we don't have that one representative. The point is, we're making fantastic music. That's we're making some really crappy music too. <laughs> but that gets sorted out, you know, it does. And I think that, that we, have, we have some very effective mechanisms in place in Seattle to filter that stuff. Um, and and I'll, I'll go ahead and mention it, 206proof.com, our, our, our premier, our being Seattle, our premier hip-hop discussion forum, right? A lot of stuff gets filtered through 206proof. And, and I think that that's essential. It keeps a whole lot of people in check. I mean, there's sure. a whole lot of shenanigans too, sure. right? right? I mean, it's, 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 not, it's not the end-all, be-all, but if that, if that mechanism wasn't in place, we'd be in trouble. We'd really be in trouble. It keeps a whole lot of things in check. So anyway, I say all that to say, like, let's stop worrying about putting Seattle on the map. Sure. That, t that discussion is just as tired as, uh, uh, you know, backpack rap, conscious rap versus You know, and that's why I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I want to talk about Minneapolis. I want to talk about uh, Detroit. Uh, you mentioned Philly, and we, should, we shouldn't stop there. We should go abroad to, uh, to Paris, for example. Absolutely. It's amazing or stuff. Even Stuttgart. Stuttgart, yeah. yeah no, that, we talked about that briefly that night. Uh, yeah, no, I'm totally, look, I, wherever hip-hop comes from, I don't really, I don't, I mean, I, it's great that it's, that it's, uh, that it has uh, this versatility and this, uh, and all this, and this accessibility for so many people around the world, but, uh, you know, to me, hip-hop is, is about, uh, um, is about this, <laughs> how do I put this, it's very difficult to express. I don't really, it comes from so many points to me. I, I am not, it doesn't, you know what I mean? It's not oh, a, yeah. I, I don't, I just listen to what's really good, then I find out what's going on, and then I see that, oh, it's, it's, it's happening in Ghana, or oh, it's happening in Tokyo, mm -hmm. you know, which is, uh, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's the relationship. But that's a consumer's perspective. Sure. Or, or at least a, uh, uh, a, a what, was, what was the term you used? A cultural critic's perspective, sure. right? As an artist, I cannot be disingenuous about the fact that Seattle, uh, that hip hop as a culture continues to be extremely territorial. It still is very much about where you come from. Yeah, that's true. But it yeah. ain't where you're from, it's where you're at. That's a, 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 that's a mantra that's lived you know, for, for longer than 30 years in, in the hip hop culture. Um, I mean, it, yeah, to some degree I disagree with it. That's why I rapped about t Tobacco Road and about being from Kentucky. To me, it's all about being where you're from. You have to make that connection. If you don't know where you're from, it's going to be really difficult to be comfortable where you're at. Yeah, but you know what? Here it is. Uh, I find that to be more of a signal than an imposition. It's more of a, there's life over here. Look, yeah. <laughs> right? It's yeah. not, it's not uh, we're coming into your town and we're taking over. In, right, in, which in is... Some, in some ways it is. And if you've ever toured, you'd know that. 
Ah, it's I true. If you're, if you're ever on the road as an artist, you'll know that. You travel to a different city. Uh, so far, to, up to this point, all I've really been able to experience is a, like a West Coast leg of a tour. We've done Western States tours, right? And, and we have a, a very strong following in places like Colorado. I mean, we could go to, to Fort Collins, to Boulder, Colorado Springs, uh, and sell out shows. Well, that bumped into New York when you're doing stuff there. New York is a, is a different place it's altogether. Its own, it's that's, its own yeah, animal. Yeah, that is, that is completely okay. different. But, but yeah, even in the, these Western states uh, where we've developed a semi-loyal fan base, you know, people who actually pay attention to what we're doing, it's still all about being from Seattle. It's weird, man. That is weird. It's weird, man. But it's true. It's true. So again, I don't mean to imply that it doesn't matter that we're making music in Seattle. It does, but it doesn't have to be Seattle-centric, the same way that it had to be New York-centric in the 80s, right. and even into the early 90s. It had to be that way, because you, like, you had to establish the fact that you were making music, not only in New York City, but you break it down to the borough or even down into the, the particular street that you're representing. East Coast, West Coast, and that's, that's still the point of reference that so many of us who are, are my age, people who are still paying attention to hip hop culture or people who are still participating in the development of hip hop culture, we have that point of reference and it does very much matter where you're from. So it's trying to find that balance. I'll say it right now, I'll never write Seattle centric music. It's not in me. This is not my home. Hmm. I happen to be here right now and it affects, it, it profoundly affects the way that I process a whole lot of things. Seattle has made me a different person than I was than I've uh, the, the, than I was when I got here. And I moved to Seattle in 2001. And over the course of the, the, the past nine years, I have become a very different person because of Seattle. But I'm not from here. There's, there's a bunch more questions that are pouring in here. Um, one of them is, Chase, you're talking about uh, hip hop, and I thought you were into MGMT. <laughs> um, but we, we don't want to. How many, how many slams are you getting? Yeah, oh, a couple. Come on, read, read all the ones that are ribbing. But, but I think that, that. But that, let's, let's, I want to just ab uh, address not that particular thing, but again, this is really about a fusion of idea, of creative ideas. And when you think about what influences you or us, or uh, arguably everyone at the table, um, it's, it's so broad. No, you, you can't subject yourself to just one channel of influence anymore right. in mass culture. That's one of the things that I think is, is made my life a richer experience for me and I hope that the people that are paying attention are out there kind of sinking their teeth into things that are outside what you think you're capable of, of um, taking in. Uh, the hip hop is just the, the context of this discussion. I mean, we're not just talking about rap and hip hop. You right. know, but, but yeah, these are all, uh, these are the, we're talking about culture. The development of culture, the, the existence of culture, the importance of culture, the effect of culture, and, and it's all in just a hip-hop context, um, primarily because that's all we know. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so th there's a little bit more chatter going on about the geography thing. I'm getting, I'm getting uh, beat up pretty hard on the old, in the old Twitter sphere about saying that the Bay Area has cooled off. <laughs> Ooh, I knew, you know, I knew that was coming, and I'm so impressed that it did. Wow. I was waiting for it, too. Your, yeah, I your viewership is really I, on just, point. Uh, as a critic, show me. You know, sh if, show if, me what's if we're recording this, rewind the tape and, and look at my posture and how it changed right as the, no. the two of you made that comment. I, I knew I, it was coming. Uh, I, I went down to the Bay Area and I was looking around and I, I just couldn't even in the, in the newspapers find anything that was happening. And that's what I'm after. I mean, when I go into a city, I really want to know who's, what's, what's the, uh, what the, what the... Um, Husala, Lil B. Yeah. Yeah? Husala and Lil B have been cited. Okay, sure, I'll yeah. go look. They're still making look. music and, and that's oh, not yeah. going to change. Yeah. What, what has changed is uh, the way that people are paying attention to what's happening in the Bay because of what's being marketed as Bay Area music. I mean, really, for all intents and purposes, the Bay Area became synonymous with the hyphy movement. And, and once that movement came and went, from a, a marketing standpoint, once I'm, I'm, I'm saying once that star uh, you know, shot across the, uh, the, the stratosphere or whatever, People stop paying attention. Ooh, that was hyphy. Mm. That was like, you know, doors open, man. Doors open, man. That type of stuff, right? This face. This face. <laughs> that, that became hot for a minute. And then people were like, oh, well, that's done. So the Bay Area must be done. And that's not true. Like, the hyphy movement did not define Bay Area music. It was a, a significant uh, part of the, the culture that they had created as Bay Area hip hop. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't the only thing that was going on. 
And, and hieroglyphics continues to, to keep producing things, right? I mean, they're still touring. They're still releasing music. They've got their clothing line thing going on. Like, Hyro is still very much relevant in hip-hop culture. And I, I think they, more so than any other crew, define what's happening in the Bay. I'm just reminded, it's Hustler, Chase. Oh, it's Hustler. <laughs> you said Husla. Husla. I, mean, that's, <laughs> I thought it was a new Muslim rapper out of the Bay. It's beautiful. <laughs> but it's beautiful. That, I mean, I'm happy to reveal my ignorance on that. I'm good at that. I'm good, yeah, good at no. dropping those balls. I'm not afraid of it. You, you, you have to work on your uh, hip hop spelling bee. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, but I, I, I take pride in, in failing on live television. It's great. No. Um, talk to me a little bit about the transition from the Common Market Project. I know that's yeah, something that's, that, that, that that's actually what I want to hear because that's an, that's a, I'm also as curious about that as well. I mean, I, as I said, I, I you know there was there was a distinct sound to the Common Market and uh, the new record. Um, of course, I mean, I love MTK, and I love what he's done in terms of like uh, his production, I mean, but it's very different from Sabzi, mm -hmm. not the same. And Sabzi, particularly when he's working with you, because Sabzi is also, is also versatile, but you guys worked on a, on a specific groove, right? And you did quite successfully, I mean, and, uh, but now there's a new, you're, you're developing another kind of groove with MTK, and, you know, it, it's... Uh, it's, it's, it's got more energy in terms of like, and it's more explosive, um, um, and also has got a sort of rock arena feel sure. to it sometimes. Oh, yeah. right. and, uh, and I feel like the source that um, MTK draws from, and I love the source, but you know, the sort of that, you know, the sort of that Just Blaze kind of um, 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 school of, of really, you know, of, um, of, of, of production values. And it's, he does it, I mean, just, it's not to discredit him. I mean, he does it really well, but I, I can tell that, my goodness, he's using a different kind of approach. Maybe he's from Everett. Maybe, maybe he's got, maybe, maybe it's for, you know, he's, he's not, uh, he's using something that's happening there, you know, I mean. Everett uh, is not a suburb of Paris either. It's just up the street here. Just know? up the street, yes. I was going to wonder if the Boeing production line had an impact on that sound. <laughs> he's got a very big feel yeah, to it, right? Yeah. That's, that's actually what struck me when I, the first time I heard them is that it is a, the sound is so much bigger than melodic, you know? Sabzi has a certain kind of yes. stitching, a fabric that he makes, and this is a lot more, it's, it's, yes. it's you know, it's, it pushes it's, more. Yeah, well, if, if you had spent your sophomore afternoons drinking at Jimmy Z's, then, uh, then you know, your, your end product would probably sound somewhat familiar. <laughs> um, yeah. Different, yeah, of course. Um, as an artist, I think you're always trying to reinvent yourself. You know, you don't want to be stale. You don't, you don't want to be the guy that everybody thinks that you are, right? Mm -hmm. Especially when some of your most vocal critics uh, have completely written you off as being credible. That's something to an artist that's very important is credibility. What, what's the point of, of me actually writing or recording or, or trying to uh, distribute a, a message if people right off the bat are already discrediting my credibility. So that, that was important. I had to evaluate a whole lot of things uh, with the, the rise of common market. Um, and I do spend a large amount of time paying attention to the negative things that people say about common market. I don't regret that at all. I really don't. Well, there are so many people who... What did you say about common market? What kind of negative things? I'm, I'm totally... I can't believe this. I, 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 hey, yeah. first of all, You've already know. established the fact that you're an academic, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's, that's who the, the music appeals to, is the academic community, right? I mean, you've got the blue scholars, and everything that Common Market has done, by some, uh, by some measure, has been an extension of what the blue scholars have done. So, I mean, you've got blue scholars. I mean, by, by definition, they are the academic raps, right? It appeals to you, and so does Common Market. And as the distinctions that you make are because of your familiarity with the genre. But you, you take somebody who's not exposed to rap music, they don't really have a, a point of reference that goes back before 2005, right? They're not able to make too many distinctions between blue scholars and common market. They become synonymous, right? In many ways. Then you add to the fact that, that I am a white male, right? I mean, what could I possibly have to rap about that represents struggle? Which is important. I don't think that, that you can have good hip hop music like, like we were, we established already that the music has to be good. How do you define good, right? So, so this is a philosophical discussion. But and it's you can't have, in, in my opinion, I'm, I'll say it 
plainly, you cannot have good hip hop music that's not rooted in struggle. I don't know about that. That's this again, that's it's an opinion. Good. Yeah, this is my opinion. So let me <laughs> let me finish the train of thought, and then we'll come back to your station. Yes. <clears throat> so so to me, that's what defines good hip hop music. Uh, music that, that people can have access to. It's got to be about a struggle. Well, being a white male from the middle class, I couldn't very well rap about uh, you know, life in the ghetto. I couldn't rap about uh, being economically deprived, or I couldn't rap about certain socioeconomic conditions that my black counterparts could rap about, right? Furthermore, I couldn't use the N-word, which is another point of discussion. There's value in this N-word in hip hop, a tremendous value. It distinguishes a black rapper from a white rapper. A white rapper is not allowed to use the N-word. So when you hear a song, whether it's on the radio, on your iPod, streaming it, whatever the case, and you hear the N-word, you know that's a black rapper. And it affects the way that you listen to the music. It affects not so much you, because I think you've established the fact that you've got this much more global view of hip hop. Not everybody listens to it the same way, though. Some people are still very much interested in who's rapping, where are they from, what are they about. Mac, uh, you know, I want to just interject because I know you got something big to say. I got yes. something small to say. Uh, Macklemore dances around that pretty elegantly. Okay, that's you know? Yeah, he, 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 he does. That was his it, first big record. Yeah, race was, is very what, important what in hip hop. I think that's, he, that's the point a, to be made. Yeah, he does a great job of addressing. Race is still very much important in hip hop music. But he he really talks about it, and I don't know how to, I don't know how to do this. I'm doing the best I can trying to dance in around this main, major cornerstone of hip hop being a white mm -hmm. privileged kid mm -hmm. from the suburbs and, and Grinch even to the same, you know, to a similar nod. But it, it's people are dancing around and I think it, you, your point is well taken that there is a, there is a uh, certain gravity in and around that that is and is not afforded depending on the, your history, your socioeconomic history, mm -hmm. your struggle. Charles. Well, okay. I want to go back because I have to go. I always go back. I always go back. Rewind. And there's a, a ton back. of stuff a coming in here stuff. too. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, I, I, uh, one thing that really impressed me earlier on in hip hop, and I, and I discovered hip hop in Zimbabwe, and so I sort of saw it from a distance. And if you if you see them from a distance, you're not you only you you're not you're not only uh, a, 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 a part of it, but you're also you're also scrutinizing it. Right, because you're seeing it from the outside, but you're also enjoying it. That's what I mean. You're a part of it. You're a part of the pleasure, but you're also an, you're also constantly analyzing what is what. How are they doing this? What's going on? What I noticed really early on in hip hop is that, uh, and this is what really what was really lost. I've, I've talked about this with Larry again and again. So this is me, Mazel. Mazel, yeah, yeah, Larry Mazel and I have conversations about about hip hop all the time. We don't agree all the time, <laughs> and I don't agree with a lot of people all the time. But um, what I did notice, and uh, very early on, and I think it still persists in the underground, not so much at all in the overground, uh, in, in the commercial rap, in the commercial world, um, was that uh, was the variety of the rappers at the very beginning. I mean, you could say that there, are, uh, you could say that, yes. It, 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 that, 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 that they're mostly black, it's true, but they were talking about all sorts of things. There wasn't this unified, there was conscious rap. There was, when I was, when I was used to buy, I used to look and just see what it is that they're doing, and it's always kind of different. Um, there was, of course, there was gangster, there was rap, there was also geek rap with De La Soul. There was this flower, hippie rap. I mean, it was all over the place. There was no central, uh, you know, uh, 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 it wasn't homogenous. It was not. Yeah. It was, this is what was really lost when it right. went commercial. This is this is really the death. I always say of of of, of that. The of, jiggy of, era. That's yes. how we define it. Yeah, the jiggy era. And then that was, was in, the and to me, uh, when so when it goes underground, I mean, to me, it, it's it's it doesn't mean. There's no way if hip hop was so close, you could have had the Beastie Boys be so successful, and so well um, regarded. Uh, uh, in the 80s, if, right. if it wasn't for this uh, fact, well, what have you got? What, what are you bringing to the table? Mm -hmm. You know, and everybody sort of brought whatever they had, and if it was, if we had, if it was backed by good music, backed by strong rhymes, right. it was in. And there was that, there was a lot of that going on, and, and I still feel that, uh, that particularly when you had, um, in the, in the mid-90s, when you had the big transition, what they did, the corporations did, I'm sorry you're going to have to bring this up, what they did was, for the sake of money, they actually reduced it. They reduced it, and now it looks, I think it looks more racial to me now than it was even at the very beginning. 
Weirdly enough, right. I can actually say something crazy so, like that, that it actually became so as... Intentionally? Intentionally, yes, of course. I mean... Limiting <laughs> supply and demand and yeah, well, they wanted, trouble. Yeah, well, they wanted a specific... You know, okay, here's... I'm going to say something really crazy and off the wall. Off the top, off the top, okay. off the top. Uh, Harry Belafonte and Sidney Poitier started acting about the same time. One of them became famous and the other one sort of like went on the side. Nobody sort of knew. The one who became super famous was Sidney Poitier. And the reason why Hollywood liked him was because he was clearly black. Right? And it was able to transmit a message to the audience. Whereas Berlifonte was light skinned and there was this. Racially ambiguous. Yeah, right. right? And they, that's, they, become, that's become the premier marketing strategy right now. And, that, and that's what everybody's up against. I, don't, that, that, I, really, don't, uh, uh, I really don't separate mm. these kinds of, um, you know, these kinds of practices right. um, with, um, with, the, with, 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 the, with certain people taking advantage. Of, uh, of, of a market, and it's also it's coding and so forth. Right. This gets a little complicated. I don't want to dive into it. Right. But you get the idea. I get the and idea. I think, that's what, I think that's what happened. But now so. that the power structure is changing and we're seeing the, the, the decline or the demise of, of corporate rap or of uh, commercialized rap, then enter Drake, right? Yes. Drake will be one of the most successful commercial rappers ever. Racially ambiguous. Yes. It's, 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 it's so leaning funny. back the other way. <laughs> I never thought of... This is my bad, my worst part. I never thought of Drake as a commercial rapper. <laughs> this is, this Who is, would have? I, I, I never really... Who would have two years ago, right? Well, but look at it now. Well, Honestly, the, the kid is making money, and he's I, rapping about money. I, I'm such a... I'm such lots a, and I lots of... I want to go back to some of the silos you were talking about, uh, and one is um, like hip-hop with a message. And uh, a lot of that... I mean, it all has a message. There's a word that's escaping me. Um, conscious. Let's go conscious hip-hop. Yeah. And, and Keras One, for example, Keras One tap oh, you tap ten, which on stage. I which, which we, we tugged on Seattle. KRS's shirt sleeve a little bit. I mean, yes. but, yeah, but, 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 but let, let me. Us. Yeah, I just want to make that clear. Okay, like. but but it was very important. I feel like in your career, when you have someone with that, with that weight in the industry, mm -hmm. saying like, one of the foremost, you're, you're continuing in this conscious hip hop, this tradition. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and you tap him, he comes up and performs on stage with you here, mm -hmm. which is, how yeah. huge is that? That's yeah. like jumps on the stage. Unbelievable to have him on stage. And then, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, you, you guys went on tour, you, you backed them on tour. Mm -hmm. What was that like? <clears throat> I mean, um, he's absolutely a legend. Yeah, without question. Uh, you know, his, his legacy, I think, continues to be... Uh, to be determined on a daily basis because he's still alive. Mm. Um, had he had the fortune of passing away 10 or 15 years ago. Getting gunned down when he first started appearing with yeah, all his then, uh, then guns yeah, KRS, and ammo. Yeah, KRS would be, you know, the silk screen t-shirts, you know, like medallions, uh, you know, honored in, in such a way that, that I don't think he'll ever have the privilege of being honored now. Um, so, so I'll say this much about KRS. Uh, in 2003, 2004, 2005, I did highly regard KRS as the teacher. That's, that's one of the many names that, that people have for KRS. He's is, also is the, the philosopher. Teacher. The philosopher. Yeah, He's yeah. a lot of different things. I mean, talk about reinventing yourself. Yeah. This guy is a master. Um, but I still hold him in, in very high esteem. Um, and and I, have to, I have to say this much, that KRS is to <clears throat> people my age who came up on East Coast hip hop what Snoop Dogg is to West Coast heads. Like, Snoop Dogg continues to make terrible music. Snoop yes. Dogg is rapping on this new Katy Perry single, right? And this, this verse is awful. It's, it's god awful. There is no way that this is, this is a master at his craft, right? Snoop has fallen off. It's official. Snoop is done. But the West Coast can have him. You just have to give me KRS. Yes, this guy says some crazy, crazy stuff. KRS is out there. He is way out there. But you have, to, you have to appreciate the reverence that I have for him in the same way that, that West Coast folks have this reverence for Snoop Dogg. Completely different people, but he is my cultural icon. So to make that connection back in 05, to actually make a Beyond personal school. connection with KRS that was based in uh, this idea of hip hop culture, um, even as a religion, hip hop as a religion, KRS and I sat down at a table and had a discussion about hip hop being a religion. And he said some pretty crazy things to me. We haven't spoken since. 
And that's important for Is people to understand. <laughs> it, it's, it's, there's Maybe. a good reason. Okay. I mean, there, or there's a good uh, probability. Okay. There is a, a strong probability that the reason we haven't maintained uh, communication since that discussion is because my views on hip hop as a religion were very much different from his. Mm -hmm. So we, we covered a whole lot of really interesting things over the span of uh, just two or three days. Um, but he said some things to me like, you should use the N-word. It, cre it, it, it creates controversy and people will pay attention to you. Yeah, Quentin Tarantino would tell you the same thing. <laughs> Absolutely, sure. <laughs> You know, he told, yeah, he told me that I should say that I'm aligned with Al-Qaeda. <laughs> These types of things. Like, we, we explored a whole bunch of different That's, philosophies, yeah. if you will, right? Yeah. KRS is philosophies. But I wasn't at a point in my life, and I'm, I'm not at a point in my life now, uh, where I was ready to embrace these, the, these ideas. For the sake you know? of them, you know? Yes, yeah. That yeah. sounds kind of heavy. Um, and, and so I, I say that because people still continue to ask me about my relationship with KRS-One. Like, what is it? What does it mean? Uh, what's the relevance of it now? I, it, it was nothing more than um, having the opportunity to, to connect with that cultural icon. You know, to, uh, yeah, I was seeking validation to some degree, but it was more so a personal validation than it was a commercial validation. Like, hey, everybody should buy my album because there's a sticker on the front with a, a quote from KRS-One. That, that was pretty insignificant. It wasn't for the sake of selling albums. This was a personal connection that I needed to make for the sake of understanding my role in hip hop culture. Can I ask you a question, just real quickly? Yeah. Uh, what's, your, what's your relationship, speaking of relationships, <clears throat> what's your relationship with the Sabzi now that you're doing this project? Um, it hasn't changed much since he moved to New York, uh, you know, from, from the way it was when he lived here in Seattle. Like, Sobs and I don't really move in the same social circles. We never have. We were introduced through mutual friends because we're both Baha'is. So through a, a Baha'i friend, we were introduced to each other and, and somewhat encouraged to make music together. I mean, it, it wasn't like, hey, you two boys run along and play, and, and Common Market is what came as a result. But the time was right. You know, the time was definitely right for us to do what we did. If it wasn't for the, the connection that we made through music, Sobs and I probably never would have met. Like, really, we, we don't hang out in the same social circle. Mm -hmm. Any of the mutual friends that we have right now that we've created as a, as a, since the formation of Common Market have just been on that pretense and that basis of music. I yeah. hope that makes sense. Yeah. Are you and, still and, making music, though? Are you still making music? No, we're not. You're not? No, no, we're not. And, and I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that we move in different social circles. Um, take Macklemore, for example. Like, in my opinion, I think it makes a lot more sense for Sobsy to produce an album for Macklemore right now than it does for us to make a common market album. Because we created the, common, the first common market album at a time when, when our circles intersected more so than, than ever before and more so since, right? That first common market album uh, the the self-titled album, in case people are, are curious, they, sure. they might not know. Um, when we made that album, it was at a time when uh, we were more connected. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I think that's what people identify. That's what they get out of that. Um, we had um, no idea what to expect when we made that album. But because the response was what it was, and because we, we had people who were interested in working with us and working for us, mm. then we said, okay, let's, let's try it again. Let's take right. the next step. So we put out another album. Then we toured to support it. Then we formed this mass line collective. Like, we're just taking baby steps. Sure. None of this was a master plan that was devised back in 2003 for us to get to where we are in 2010. We really just took it one step at a time. I'm, I'm good friends with Sabzi, and, and, and we had lunch not too long ago, maybe two weeks ago, at Cafe Giton in New York. And he said almost exactly the same thing that you said. This is not some master plan, <laughs> you know? We're, we're, right, make, right. we're making music, and sometimes you're like this, and then you're kind of like this, and, you know, paths may cross sure, again. Sure. I mean, I, I actually liked when you... Uh, I, I'm a huge Common Market fan, obviously, uh, and when you started doing some stuff with the live band, like, you had like eight pieces behind you sure, or something. Yeah, yeah like, I think that's a beautiful sound. It's a beautiful piece, and... Uh, as, a, as an independent artist myself, I want to drift in and out of different levels of communication with the people that I collaborate with, co-conspirators, collaborators, and is this, is this somewhat like that, when you're, you're just kind of drifting in and out? Very much so, 
very much so. And, and I can't say that it's not hard to, to catch feelings. You know, like sometimes you do take this stuff personally, um, particularly when you start to resent things. Now, not people, but, but lack of opportunity or, or missed opportunities and that sort of thing. Like, yes, I will always wonder what would have happened if I would have worked a little bit harder. What would have happened if, if my motivation was different? Well, but to what become artist, more. What artist doesn't? No, I, exactly. You know I'm not saying that I'm an anomaly. Okay. I, I'm just saying that that's the, the sort of things that you deal with. And believe me, it can get really tricky in your head. Like, people can, people can start to say, well, uh, you know, Saab said this. And then they go back to Saab's and say, Ra said this. Or what's happening with you guys? There is, there is no beef between me and Sabzi. It, it, it has nothing to do with, uh, with a, a break in our friendship or with a, uh, with a rift or, or anything that, that we can't get past. When we're talking about the creation of music, we're talking about two different things. We're talking about, uh, again, accessibility or, or his availability, sure. us being connected in some way. Mm -hmm. And then we're talking about what the consumer wants or you know, what the fan wants. So which way are we creating music? Are we creating it because the time is right or are we creating it because fans want more common market music? I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask a question or two from people on the internet who are writing in via Twitter to uh, Hashmark, uh, CJ Live. Um, Marco Collins, a uh, well-known well -known DJ, um, describes the uh, Seattle sound as musical intelligence with knowledge. And I don't know, that sounds, that sounds pretty heavy. If Marco says it, then you just have to accept <laughs> it. There's, there are some folks in this community who speak with such authority. Marco is one. He dropped the bomb there, it was a good yeah. one. No, I gotta be honest, Marco, I have no idea what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> Musical intelligence with knowledge? Yeah, music intelligence. Oh, I like music that. intelligence it, it, it with sounds, knowledge. He says it sounds big. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I'm, it doesn't have to. I really don't think it does. Let's talk about Vitamin D's production uh, for a second. Or even Jake One's production. Jake One would be a probably a good one because he's got a larger, larger... I love Vita. Course, sure, but. sure. Specifically with Vitamin, I don't think his sound is big. Oh. If we're talking about big versus small. I don't know. I, 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 bump. I, I, bump. I don't know. Bump. Bigness to me... It's different. Like, it, it, it is know. very much rooted thinking, in the West Coast sound. Anything in message... Well, no, no. Wait, I, actually, uh, the production that I, I've heard, you know, with um, uh, with Chocolate's last record, uh -huh. uh, which he produced, was it, it was pretty full. I mean, yeah. it was rich. I got to give you that. You yeah, know, that's, and, that, to me, that's different. I'm talking and, more so uh, about stuff that he did for like encore. Well, yeah, but like on the layover. In or the something D Black's like that. last record, that I mean, that heavy. I mean, there was, there was some, some real rocking. I should be clear Full that this is, I'm not trying to discredit Vita <laughs> no, no, at I'm not, all. I'm not right? Vita is one of my favorite producers. No, 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 but no, no, it's not a matter of discrediting. I'm just saying um, we're just deciding. Big I mean, versus small oh, sound. And, and, yeah. and, and, and I think Vita, if I was going to go for small sound, I, I would, there's other producers that I think really do that. Well, this is not to say they're, that a, a producer's bad or good, whether no, they're no. doing a big sound or a, oh, or, no. or, or a minimal sound. I mean, that, to my, my, that, that's, that's neither here nor there. I mean, you can do a big sound and be horrible. In fact, scare everybody <laughs> yeah. away, right? I mean, either way of the question. But I was just my question is, well, what kind of sound do, is is Vita's sound? That's all. That's all. Did Vita weigh in on this? Uh, Vita, no, Vita's still sleeping. No, I think. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but a lot of people have. We got Grinch is writing in saying, "Hey, oh, what's say up?" Hi. Uh, we'll say hello to Grinch. Where are you, buddy? Nice one. Um, interesting. Go back to the territorial comment that you made. Mm. Um, the net has made hip hop less territorial comes from Andrew Madsen. I agree. I agree with him. I, that's and my and, and as, that's a, like as that. an example, he talks about Drake, the biggest star being... From Canada. <laughs> mm -hmm. He's got uh, Houston, Atlanta, Vegas, all kind of stirred up together. I mean, that... And, and oh, he, Madsen's talking more so about Drake's style, like his, uh, his, his sound. He's from... The inf he said, uh, specifically, Drake says, I disagree. The Nets made hip hop less territorial. Biggest star is Drake, and he's from Houston, Atlanta, Vegas. All <laughs> one word. I oh, I thought Drake was from Canada. But and let's uh, throw in Vancouver. Houston, Vancouver, Atlanta, Vegas. You can also <laughs> say, uh, you know, uh, what, what's his, Henri Osborne's new project with a DJ from Chicago. I mean, people are just mixing things up right now. Right. Uh, you know, uh, well, just to, to Matson's point really, really, really quick, that I don't think the internet has made hip-hop as a, a culture or as, a, as a, a form of music 
any less ter territorial, you're, you're, you're really just able to rep your turf globally now much more easily. Ah. Like, the internet hasn't made people stop caring about where the music comes from. And I'm not saying this is, this, this is across the board for hip hop fans, for people who pay attention to rap music. We have to take into uh, account the fact that we're talking about multi -gener uh, different generations right. of people who've listened to hip hop. I'm, I'm, I'm approaching 40 years old now. You know, so I, I started listening to rap music when you know, 84, 85, 86, right? Early Fat Boys stuff and old Run DMC and some Fat stuff like boys. that. Boys. Nice. <laughs> we got one. Boys. Now, he was close enough. He was close <laughs> enough. We got to give him that. <laughs> so, so for people my age, I think for people, and, and again, this is not a blanket statement, but I can speak for a whole lot of people when I say we still very much care where the music comes from. Or, you know, what, what conditions are you coming out of? What, what inspires you to rap about what you rap about? And so, yeah, maybe a younger generation. And, and also, we're, we're not big fans of Drake either. You see what I mean? Drake's, Drake's biggest support group, I think, are, are much younger kids. Kids who might identify with the third wave of rap, or people who are common market fans, as opposed to like, you know, us as as artists. Um, I don't know if I've made a very clear point. All I wanted to say was uh, I think the internet has has not cheapened the the significance of where music is created. There's still a, a a large amount of people who care about that stuff. Yes. Yeah, well, by the way, my my point was uh, Dark Time Sunshine. That was the band yeah, that I had in my mind. Honor's project. Honor's project, but that project is really, you know, it's a melding of two, two different forms. They're touring. You know, They're touring. That's in, yeah, that's important. Yeah. When, you can, when you can do a successful tour, when you can get your music out on the road, that stuff is really important still, especially at an indie level. Go bigger. M.I.A. Mm -hmm. Oh, I hate her. You know, I, I really do. And I tell you why. I, I, uh, I, I, first of all, I've never been a, a super fan of her music to begin with. But um, right now, not even Galang Galang. That ooh. Galang, that early Galang Galang. I, I thought it was okay. Okay, I at least thought you, it was okay. At least you thought it really? was okay. You didn't hate it then. No, I didn't. No, and uh, right now, so it got from okay to worse, is what is what is what her trajectory is at the moment, and um, but uh, 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 how how do I put this? Um, the, her, I, the I think you've already passed the point of, of being delicate. Yes, the you already said you hated it. Now oh, what are you worried about saying? The contradictions have, have even consumed the music. So there's even, there isn't any music anymore. It's just uh, the, uh, Emma uh, is watching right uh, now for sure. Is she? <laughs> oh yeah. Well, tell her to tweet her about it and say put my phone number on Twitter as well. And another <laughs> stranger reporter. His she number is two oh six. She issued a statement uh, about Lady Gaga. Not, not oh, that another one. Which, uh, yeah, another yeah, issuing which statement. Was, yeah. yeah. I'm going to rip through a bunch of things on this on my little uh, my iPad here. Um, props to Scion Ra for his race awareness. But how do we take this discussion beyond the black and white? So I, well, I'd like to you to comment on it, uh -huh. but I'm going to massively limit what you can say. Yeah, that's fine. Short. It's it's very important to acknowledge race and that it it does have an effect on on so many different things, but in this hip hop context of our discussion, Race is, is still very much important in hip hop, and we have to acknowledge that. How do we take it past the binary? Do we want to? Is it important that we do? I mean, at what point do we, do we, do we say we are past race uh, without it being conjecture? Good point. Um, and, I, and I also want to say I've not done a very good job of acknowledging my whiteness. Uh, in the way that we talked about Macklemore. I mean, Macklemore mm. writes a song called White Privilege, mm. and, and people track. identify with it, people get it, mm. because it's out there. Like, me identifying with my whiteness, my, my masculinity, it's, it's, it really is in a much more subtle way. Um, and I've chosen to do that. But, but again, it, acknowledgement is the very first step. We have to acknowledge it. And it's a strange recent controversy in my life. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but I almost do not identify with my blackness. And this is a bizarre thing to say because when you're in Africa, you just you can't see it; mm. it doesn't exist, right? It's 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 the strangest thing to do because when you're used to it, it's um, it's uh, uh, it's it's it becomes part of the fabric, right? Well, it's just you know, uh, it, it's just blackness not, is ubiquitous. <laughs> it's, it's not there. I mean, in fact, you don't even. I mean, it just it just leaves your mind. The moment it leaves your mind and you're used to it not being there for a long time, mm. then uh, you actually. You, you, you white people know. are the same way. Yes, you know, of they, course. they spend yes. most of their yes, time yes. surrounded by white folks, right? Yes, and so yes. they forget about yes. their whiteness. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's, that's a problem 
But when they have to interact with other cultures. It, it becomes an issue when they can't apply the sensitivity that's required to relate to, to issues of race. Yeah. And so they revert to this default mechanism of saying, oh, it's always about race. Charles, you're always playing the race card. When in fact you never identified, and, and I'm speaking now specifically about uh, one issue, but, but with that issue, you never specifically said, the teacher is a racist. That wasn't your statement. The statement was, the teacher failed to realize that there are racial implications. There, there are race matters that apply to this, these circumstances, right? Yes. And, and that's, it, it's about awareness. It's about sensitivity. Yeah, it's ahead, not Charles, about being racist. Charles is about to jump out of no, his No, no, I agree, I agree, I agree. No, no, it's totally, you know, uh, a lot of people, you just brought up a big point. Um, uh, you, uh, we, you know, the word we use in Africa is Europeans. No one actually uses white. You say European. Muzungu. Yeah, yeah. Muzungu, Muzungu is uh, <laughs> kind of the, uh, the, the blanket you know, for, for whites. And it does mean foreigner. Yes, it does. That's actually, I mean, that's a very important point. And a lot of people don't see this. But to get to my thing is, uh, in Zimbabwe, you have to have, there is the cultural sensitivity. This was another thing that I was trying to point out, was to say there is cultural sensitivity. In Zimbabwe, we have this uh, situation between uh, the Shonas and the Matabilis. It's a long historical thing. It sure. involves almost, I mean, there's maybe Europeans came in in the middle of the 19th century there. But for the most part, color is not the issue here. But it's as profound and as uh, difficult as a racial situation. Yeah. And you have to be sensitive to it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And this is what it is. Weirdly You can't enough. just go and say, uh, you know, it doesn't matter that you're shown. Yes, you're right. No, you it, get does the point. it does matter. It does and, matter. It does matter. And it does matter in what like, context because lots of people died. You can, you can tell me all you want. So, like, so, so, you so, so, don't see you, race. So, like, so, me, so I don't see I, color. I, I, do, I do agree with this point. But, yeah, yeah. that's all. All right. No, that's good. I'm going I'm to keep on this little short. Like, I want a little burst sure. from each of you guys. Um, we need a buzzer. <laughs> and okay. Toronto hip hop. Rich Kid, Tona, Theology. Oh my God. Oh man, the world is just blowing up. I, I lost track of, uh, of, uh, of Toronto with. Um, Maestro Fresh West? No, you even remember that? Chuck Lair. <laughs> Chuck, Lair. <laughs> Chuck Lair. Take it back to Maestro Fresh West. Again, growing, 19... up, growing up in Louisville, Kentucky, like, we, we paid attention to what was going on in Toronto. And I was a huge fan of Maestro Fresh West. Drop the needle. Let your backbone slide. Like that stuff was hot. Man. Oh, that's that's yeah. mid to late '80s rap. And there's you know, Aristotle out of as well. Aristotle was out of sure. was out of Toronto. If I'm correct, I think he was. But then, yeah, Toronto went from you know that that late '80s party rap into more of the conscious backpack yeah, stuff. Yeah. And yeah, you get uh, people like I think Cardinal Official. That's yeah. that's, that's, that's Toronto rap, rap, right? Yeah. All right, yeah. Toronto's to, dead. Oh, let, let me just finish with Cardinal Official then. All, All right, I want to say Official. is like, yeah, Cardinal Official. You take that back to like quintessential backpack conscious rap, right? He represented the underground for the longest time. And, and now he's more so known for commercialized hits. It's, and, and that's not to say he sold out. This is just a transition that's being made. Nobody paid attention to Toronto until Cardinal started rapping with like uh, Natalie Imbruglia, or whoever the hell it was. Rick James' wife wants to know what makes you cry. <laughs> what shoots you right in the heart? Onions are the only thing that make me cry, man. That's the only time I ever cry, chopping onions. What, are, what hits you in the heart if it doesn't make you cry? Uh, uh, matters related to my daughter. Uh, being a father, I think, is, is what motivates so, so much of my, my being, uh, so many of my decisions, and, and I am constantly terrified that I'm making wrong decisions. And, and so sometimes, yeah, I, I lose sleep over the fact that <laughs> I've gone wrong as a, as a parent. Um, that affects me pretty deeply. Um, I won't get into the whole crying thing. I cannot remember the last time I cried. And that's, that's, that's not to say that uh, as a, as a uh... no, man, I think it was more the heart, like emotionally connected. And, and, yeah, and, no, and but I, I, I talk about daughter, this, this whole it. idea of crying. Like I, I have, I feel like I've been uh, disconnected from so many of my emotions since living in Seattle. I talked a little bit about conditioning and about how this place really can affect uh, the person that you become. Mm -hmm. I think I have become very cold and callous since living in Seattle. Wow. How does uh, hip hop kind of play into or parse into more visual mediums like uh, like photography, like filmmaking? Man, that As a that filmmaker, ship has I want to sailed. hear from you on this. That ship has really sailed, um, and I'm talking uh, on a on a commercial level. When I think back to like the late '90s, mid to late '90s, uh, when companies like Coca Cola 
were using underground rap to promote things like Sprite. Like the first time I ever saw Grand Pooba rap in a Sprite commercial. And then they had Pete Rock and CL Smooth promoting Sprite. Oh, KRS One, my friend. KRS One yeah, KR in the ring. In the ring. In the ring. Like I mean, these, this was important. This stuff was really important. Um, then, towards the late '90s, when 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 we had the development of that that Jiggy era rap, it just became not so much more about promoting a product, but about yeah. selling a million records. I mean, it really became about making all the money that you could make. So is, is, is hip hop music contingent on visual media to, to sell records? I mean, no. as, uh, as, as a filmmaker and a yeah, photographer, this is, this is an interesting point oh, yeah. for me. And, and it's very interesting to Sergio here, who's yeah, written yeah. it a couple times now. It's when I perceive and when I feel hip hop music, and when I, in one way, when I feel it visually, as in it's, it lands on my senses, there's a thickness, a depth to that presentation mm -hmm. that has a profound effect on me. And is that what's make, what makes people buy records? I mean, a lot of the audience there are visual artists, and, and this, is a loaded, this is a loaded gun. So what, I mean, well, you're a filmmaker, Charles. Well, what? you know, um, to begin with, you don't, Hip hop sort of grows up at a time when visual images are more and more accessible. The production of imagery, right? right. Uh, production of video becomes. I mean, it's, it's almost uh, it's, you know, yo yo MTV raps is. Oh, you can't separate that with um, with like modern era hip hop. It's, right. it's crazy, and all of that was about you know was about you know that was very territorial. I have to admit, because you got to see you know. Um, uh, the Bronx. The, the, the Bronx. Yeah. You got Not to see. You got. You got. You got to see. Uh, you know, if it was in Houston, it, it would be the Ghetto Boys. You'd sure. see what that was like, and yeah. it was. It was. It was a way. It was a kind of a. Uh, it was a cross street sign in every video, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, like yeah, there's yeah. that that yeah. pan yes. out shot of the cross. It goes street back yeah. to yes. location yes, and yes. where you're no, from. I'm telling yes, you, yeah, very much. But, very important. But right now, I mean, it's uh, so. So there's this early marriage between the the, the video form and hip hop and. <laughs> uh, and today, I mean, even the current situation in Seattle is that a guy like Zia um, made an imprint, it made, it made an, uh, 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 definitely helped shape sure. the, the, the image language of that, of, of, uh, for me at least, right. of, um, of, the, of, the, of the scene. One and additional so, point, it, it further illustrates the importance of, of race in hip hop and, and class in hip hop. People want to know what what the person looks like that they're listening to. Does that make sense? And I think that's the importance of, of the visual element uh, that accompanies the, the music, right? Uh, take Yellow Wolf, for example. Are you familiar, familiar with uh, this rapper, Yellow Wolf? Uh, you know, you hear him and, and right away you can identify the fact uh, he's a white rapper uh, because he's got that intonation. You could just tell he's a white rapper, right? Um, but it's not until you start to watch the videos. I mean, sure, he's conveying a message right. through the music and the more you listen, the more you identify. But it's not until you watch the video that you start to decide whether you like this guy or whether you don't like this guy. That was the and that stuff. Uh, there, there's so definitely important. some gravity there that I think is interesting. Uh, as some, a visual it's, artist, myself. it's beyond some gravity. And when I said earlier that that ship had sailed, what I was talking about was the commercialization of it. Sure. Like, how important is it to uh, to use the music to mm -hmm. sell a product visually? No, but the, the the visual component of hip hop culture is still so so important. You know, Very it's so strange. And also, it comes out of the music as a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know this is how I work. I don't I don't make films in the way I write. I make films literally by thinking about images. What what image what image do you catch, yeah. right? What needs to be seen? To and uh, yeah, and what, how do you build around this image? I always say find this one image and then work your way around it in terms of like how you're going to shoot it, how you're going to get to it. Right. But I always say What's when you look at a film, to the image? yeah, yeah. That, that, it has to be. Yeah. You know, I think all great. This is now talking about imagery and and and, and, and cinema. And so I, I remember I was uh, 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 Black Stacks has a new record called uh, um, um, Talking Buildings, just released a couple of weeks ago. And they have, in that record, they have a song called Like These. And I already, the image was of an airplane landing in slow motion. And it's weird enough, that's all it was, that's all I needed to see. And I'd say, I, if I was to shoot anything, that's what I would aim at and depart from. Right? And so whenever I hear music, one thing I liked when Zia 
worked with you guys with, this, with, you, with the wonderful collection of videos you did during the snowstorm here in Seattle. Mm. Yeah, I love that. Which was just, I mean, you, it was a great way. The music right. and the snow, and everybody knew that it was a really difficult moment, and you guys took advantage of it and mm. placed a, a, a sort of like a stamp on what everybody was, everybody was suffering because you couldn't move in the city. When it snows, you're stuck. Instead of that, <laughs> you went out and you made beautiful videos with beautiful music. And, um, and, and to me, this is, again, and I, what, I, what I caught in that video was actually the way you were cleaning the car window, getting rid of the snow. And weird enough, you always yep. want that, that image right. that, gets you, that gets you right there, Thanks, and then you move away from it, and, and you move towards it. And that's how, I, that's how I've always, in the two films I've made, I've, every scene sequence has, is looking for literally the... The, 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 the yeah the, the one the one that communicates everything. That's, that's the academic in him talking. Right. Of course, well, he sees this abstract imagery. But so do I. And it's valuable. <laughs> no, <laughs> so, yeah, of course, because that's that's, that's, that's the core of what that's I where you come from. Bring the right, thing that's right. in here yes. and make it into a little bit of reality. For the average consumer, what they want to know is what does that guy look like. A lot of people. What is he uh, wearing? Know, that's that's extremely important. It's the fashion. light over here is uh, someone who's writing, and she talks a lot about that. She's the only white girl in a black village right now. She's mm. talking a lot about being seen and, and the lever that that pulls for someone. Um, I think the visual aspect does, in some ways, pulls what you're talking about within the culture of hip hop. Mm -hmm. When as filmmakers and, and and visual artists. It's about taking this fuzzy idea, and there is an image that represents it. What is that image, and how do you get access to it? Mm -hmm. Again, the, the, the background here is that I wanted to bring people on this little platform who have inspired me and, and who drive more of the artist in me from um, pictures to visual artists to musical artists to writers, filmmakers like yourself. Um, and I'm looking for tons of feedback, so do send it along. Uh, since you've performed, I'm going to go back to the uh, back to the phones, as they say, and uh, just pull a couple more questions because it, it okay. seems there's like a, a, a little rabid. I've, I've been impressed by the the dialogue so far. Um, what do you think of Saul Williams? Oh, <laughs> somebody wants to speak. No, go ahead. You go ahead. Nope. I'm going to. You, no, you, you can't. No, you can't. You can't no. burst out of that. No, no. You can't burst. I'll, I'll say this much about the the art form of spoken word poetry or okay. slam poetry. Um, it, it has this, this same sort of negative connotation in, in hip-hop uh, circles that the conscious backpack rap has gotten. So I think it's very much still in the same group, the same class of people. Okay. So people have stopped paying attention to it because somebody said it was corny. Somebody said it, it, it doesn't have any relevance. It's old stuff. Get with the new program, right? I think that's what happened with a lot of slam poetry, and I think that's why it... It doesn't have the same following now that it did in, in 99 and you know, through 2003 or 2004. Good enough. You want to bring... Saul Williams is a fantastic artist. Uh, that's, that's you know, it. I mean, I, uh, I agree. Uh, I mean, he's talented. Um, but again, I, I've always... Okay, I want to stop because I get into my whole hip hop purist okay, thing. Okay, we don't have time for your whole hip hop purist thing. <laughs> and I want, so I, you and, uh, you uh, got to say something about Saul but, Williams. But, but Saul Williams... Eh, you know, I'm not into it. That's all. I'm good, good, good artists to start with. For a lot of folks, are like this is the the most in depth hip hop thing that some of the audience has come in contact with in their life. Um, Being Saul Williams? No, today, oh, right we, now. Are we re we're recommending? Yeah, I want to, and that, and some of the folks at home want to know, like, all right, I'm sold. What what? Give me a few names. Drop a few names. Oh man, this is so hard. That's like saying which gate do you enter? You know, to the to the palace. You know, yeah, I like. Don't no, then just then if you use. Speaking less of discretion. palaces, I would say Shabazz Palace. Yes. I'm, I'm a critic. I have no problem sure. with this question. Shabazz Palace. Shabazz Palace. Yeah, grew up definitely here at, at right out of Seattle. Now. Just now getting some national attention. Yep. And uh, and uh, making of course, I mean, everybody sort of gets right. their background. Right. He uh, the, uh, uh, ish. Who does it as a background with uh, Diggable Planets? But yep. he's sort of reinvented himself, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a Bash Palace. Is, is pretty much, I think, one of the one of the, one of the big pulses sure. coming out of the city. Right. Um, Let's talk about beyond the city. Then right here, keep going. Oh, and, and I'm still not clear whether we're recommending uh, something that's current or or just a point of reference for somebody. Which artist? Good starting point. Oh, goodness. go back and listen to some early X Clan. Like uh, without oh. a doubt, like I think that. <laughs> Yeah, I, that, that represents uh, yeah. such a significant point in time uh, with the development of hip-hop culture. And if you, if you can't 
really identify with the music and the message of X Clan, you're going to have a really hard time understanding the context of this this whole discussion about hip hop today. Okay, good. Uh, where's your album available? Online, it's and you digital can find only, right? Digital only. Love that. That's amazing. Um, and iTunes. Yeah, all of the major uh, online retailers. Amazon. You know, I, I would say, also, just, just read on the web. And there's, I mean, I'm going to say, make a plug. I like Andrew Matson at the Seattle Times. And I think what he's listening to, yeah. I even keep up with it. And I also, I'm, because he writes for my paper, right. you know, guys like Larry Mizell. I mean, oh, they're yeah. local and some sorts, yeah. but it's just keeping your ears open on the, um, right. your eyes open on what's going on in the web and what the, all the buzz is and all that stuff, you know. It certainly is the Wild West, and this show is very much part of the Wild West. So um, tell us what we did poorly, tell us what we did well. Um, this is, there's been a lot of requests for more of this, and I promise to deliver it. Yeah, um, ju just don't say things like, uh, less hip-hop, please. This is not a <laughs> hip-hop discussion. Again, I like I think right. it, it bears repeating. Uh, this is just the, the, the framework of our discussion of today. Yeah, it's, it's very, very culture-oriented. and uh, You don't have to be into hip-hop and rap music to understand what it is that we're talking about today. And, and I dare to say that your, your next segment will actually touch on some of the very things that we're touching on right now, just in yep. a completely different context. From an architect's perspective, or a designer, or, or an inventor. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, anything else you guys would like to add? Because I, I, I want to uh, say farewell, unless you got... You want to throw something? No, I, I'm, I'm, thank you, you very you much. Film, this is, first of all, film to plug. Uh, I, no, I, I was going to plug. Yes. I, no, <laughs> I can't, I, I can't plug my films. Uh, if you, uh, I, I will if you don't. Yeah, if you, you can, but uh, you know, I, uh, just plug them, Charles. Just plug I, uh, I, I've made two films. One is called Police Beat, and uh, that's, uh, that's available on Netflix. You can just download it. I think it's actually for free even right now. And then there's one called Zoo, which is not for free, for a good reason. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you can go check that, too. I met him with Rob DeVore. Uh, we're, we're partners, we're filmmakers, and we're working on a project right now. Um, I also just want to really thank, I mean, um, everybody, you know, I, I, all over, really, all over. The, I mean, I'm sorry I have a global perspective. Mm. No, but anybody who's doing hip hop in the world is giving me pleasure. I want to thank them. Mm. Really right. honest, that's, that's how I feel about it. And. Uh, and locally, I just want to thank you know uh, everybody who's really made the scene so exciting at this moment, and, uh, and I want to thank you know Raw for inviting me today. He did; it was him. It was his idea, and I want to thank yeah. him for being so uh, can, thinking about what can you do to make things come together. This is what's happening at the moment. That's my last thing. That's my last thing, and, and uh, that's all. What about you? Buddy? Oh, and ten forty, Roger. You're always on my mind. I love your stuff. Love it. You're the, one of the best producers out there. What about you? Just a message of thanks as well. Uh, thank the both of you for participating. When I, when I approached you with this idea, I, I had uh, very little in, in mind uh, in terms of you know, how it would unfold or what we would accomplish. Uh, but you're right. I, I, wanted to, I wanted to do something different. Uh, we even talked about the, the idea of making a music video out of this sort of thing. Right. Uh, what we're trying to do is, is reach people through this, this medium. Maybe I'll have my good friend Mike Realm remix this thing. Mike's an amazing DJ out of the Bay Area. Apparently hip hop's you've not just, so dead. You've just, <laughs> lost, you've just lost your relationship to the Bay Area. No. Nobody in the Bay Area is doing anything for you now. <laughs> but, but again, you know, neither of you had to commit to this sort of thing. I mean, you're, you're both busy people, and, and this takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of effort to make this thing happen. But we do it because we we do want to make people aware that we're doing things here. And, sure. and we, are, we really are just sharing a very small portion of, of what's happening here in our world with the rest of this world. And we are connected. We are so very much connected. The world is a very connected place. I want to thank uh, all of the, my team for pulling this together. It's no small feat. It seems like you just got a couple, three of us sitting around a little white table here. But in reality, a lot's going on let's, behind the scenes. Yeah, let's um, pull the curtain and reveal. Yeah, if we pulled the curtain, uh, you'd see a bunch of people really working hard to help make this possible. So thank all you guys uh, on the cameras and running cables and uh, over on the soundboard and, and our technical director, D'Artagnan, for mixing this thing up. It looked beautiful, a couple of snippets that I saw. So. I'm sure we made plenty of mistakes, but yeah. without further ado, uh, I want to sign off and say thank you very much, and stay tuned. You guys know where to find all of us online, and hope we bump into you in the real world sometime. Peace. Peace, as they say. <laughs> Thanks, man. Ah. Thanks, buddy. Thank you.